Hello world, good afternoon, namaste and Nissan Bulavinaka from Sydney, Australia. I am Sashi Singh and welcome once again to Sashi Singh's Talking Point on this last Sunday in April. We return to the airwaves via Facebook Live after an absence of one week for the Easter break last weekend. I, I hope that you all had a safe and a blessed and reflective Easter weekend. In episode 17 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point program this afternoon, we will shortly be joined by Professor Wadhan Narsi, one of Fiji's former sons, well-renowned economist and a prolific writer. In an in-depth interview with Professor Narsi, we will discuss his beginnings, early professional life, entry into politics, the culture of coups in Fiji and its effect on Fiji's economy, and other topics of interest in Fiji, including the current 2013 Constitution. As we begin, may I please request that you share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that we may share the interview with Professor Narsi with as many interested people as possible, and to ensure that you receive instant notifications for all future programs, please like the SSTP page and follow us too, if you can. Here at SSTP, we celebrate yet another milestone. Our SSTP page has reached just over 90,000 people. And for this, my sincere thank you to all our viewers who have watched and supported the program so far. It is you who has taken uh, the time to follow us and to be part and parcel of the SSTP program on Facebook Live. Thank you for your continued support, 90K and still rising. If you are joining us for the first time this afternoon, a big welcome to you, to our regulars, our milestone uh, milestone followers, and our top fans. Welcome back. I hope you enjoy this afternoon's program with Professor Narsi. Welcome to the Thinking People's Program, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, live on Facebook, and also live on YouTube. Well, as always, we begin today's program, episode 17 of SSTP, with a warm welcome after a week's break to our regular contributor, former Fiji TV journalist, Nikhil Singh, to tell us of the happenings of the political week in Fiji and in Australia. Nikhil, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to episode 17. Hello, Sashi. Indeed, a a great break. Yes. And... uh, Uh, A well-deserved break, no doubt about that. Well, let's start things off uh, in Fiji. Uh, A staggering $62.8 million, Nikhil, is owed to city and town councils in Fiji. The National Federation Party has pointed the finger at the Fiji First Government. What's the story here? Well, Sashi, in 2018, municipal councils uh, were owed $31 million in rates. The Minister for Local Government, Premila Kumar, revealed last week that the figure is now $62.8 million. Uh, The National Federation Party puts this as the government's financial mess, as reported in communication Fiji Limited's Fiji Village. NFP leader Biman Prasad says the total control and micromanagement of municipal councils by the Bainimarama and Fiji First Governments for the last 13 years is largely responsible for the financial mess of most of uh, uh, town and city councils. Prasad says whenever the opposition says something he does not like, the Prime Minister Bani Marama says they are lies. The NFP leader says Bani Marama cannot deny these figures as they have come from his own Minister for Local Government. He says services in some urban major urban areas are in a state of collapse and corruption and fraud probes have been announced in at least five different town councils, Sashi. And as you are aware, the Fiji First government has refused to hold municipal elections 
a requirement under the Local Government Act since the military coup of 2006. In 2014, Government Minister Praveen Bala, after taking on the local government portfolio, said, and I quote, one of my immediate tasks and priority is to hold the municipal elections. Eight years on, Sashi, still no local government elections. Well, yes, indeed. Now, the Fiji Labour Party says it is essential for all opposition parties in Fiji to remain vigilant and set up a joint mechanism to closely monitor every aspect of the election. The Fiji Labour Party says opposition parties have expressed a number of concerns on matters relating to the general elections. What's the story about, Nikhil? Well, the FLP says there is a lot of talk about coalitions as the general elections uh, nears. Uh, some opposition parties have already announced who they will work with should they win. But the FLP says all that may end up being just a pipe dream should the elections not be free, fair and credible. Reference has been made by the FLP um, to the 2018 um, election outcome uh, where the National Federation Party and Sodelpa took matters to court but later withdrew uh, for reasons best known to them. But the FLP leader and former Prime Minister Mahendra Chaudhry says opposition parties have expressed a number of concerns they wish to see addressed and resolved well before the read of elections is issued. So he's talking about this collective um, uh, group uh, that have expressed concerns. Uh, he said, and I quote, amongst them is the engagement of the widely discredited National Database and Registration Authority of Pakistan, or NADRA, um, as they are known, by the Fijian Elections Office to provide software for its elections management system. NADRA has been prosecuted a number of times in Pakistan for issuing fake identity cards to terrorists and for its involvement in electoral fraud. Uh, it was allegedly recruited by the Fiji Elections Office without calling for expression of interest. Another matter is the refusal by the Electoral Commission to have the ballot papers serially numbered uh, as used to be the case in all other elections before the Bani Marama takeover. Um, Mr. Chaudhry says, in, in his view, a credible ballot paper reconciliation account is not possible unless the papers are numbered, Sashi. All right, now, the 2021 United States Department of State Country Reports on Human Rights Practices for Fiji was released last week. Fiji's Public Order Act has been highlighted in this report, Nick Hill. Yes, Sashi, um, again, uh, we have reported this in previous episodes. There have been arrests made for the alleged breach of the Public Order Act, which gives the authorities wide-ranging powers. Um, in recent years, trade union members and officials, including the FTUC's National Secretary, uh, Felix Anthony, has been charged for allegedly breaching the Public Order Act. Uh, the Fiji Times has highlighted a number of issues contained in the report, including the use of the Public Order Act. Um, and according to the Fiji Times, uh, the report states the Public Order Act allows authorities to use whatever force necessary to prohibit or disperse public and private meetings after due warning to preserve public order. The Act permits military personnel to search persons and premises without a warrant from a court and to take photographs, photographs rather, fingerprints and measurements of any person. Uh, police and military officers also may enter private premises to break up any meeting considered unlawful. The Public Order Act explicitly disallows any judicial recourse for harm suffered when the government is acting under its provision, uh, the report has stated. Uh, the Act further allows authorities to suspend normal due process protections where necessary to enforce public order. So this is what's been contained uh, as part of the report, uh, uh, the US report on human rights, Sashi. All right, and uh, Nikhil, in wrapping up the highlights of the week uh, in terms of Fiji news, it will be remiss of SSTP not to mention or discuss our proud Fijian Andrua team creating history last night 
in the Australian Super W competition. Let's hear it. Oh, well, Sashi, what a, what a proud moment for Fiji. Um, the sheer determination, courage, all on display by the Fijiana Drua side at Amy Park in Melbourne last night. They fought gallantly. Um, Nine Network reports that the Fijiana Drua have completed an incredible, unbeaten debut Super W season by beating the New South Wales Waratahs 32-26 in a thrilling final. I must add, Sashi, that the Waratahs has been a dominant force in this competition. They have actually, since, in, since its inception in 2018, they have won all titles, but that changed last night. Um, and Drew a lock, Jade Coates, I think, summed it up best by saying, and I quote, this is history for us and a day we'll never forget. It's created a pathway for girls and women playing rugby. Well said indeed, and what a performance. And uh, once again, congratulations to the Fijian Drua, Fijian and Drua team. Well done. Now, closer to home, uh, Nikhil. Um, security deal between our neighbours, the Solomon Islands and China, has been signed despite Australia's efforts to try and convince the Solomons not to press ahead. The opposition says it's Australia's worst foreign policy failure. More on that, please. Well, as reported in The Guardian, the Morrison government sounded the alarm over the deal, arguing the pact has been negotiated in secret and could undermine stability in our region. The Foreign Affairs Minister, Maurice Payne, and the Minister for the Pacific, Zed Sazelza, um, said they were deeply disappointed by the deal and would seek further clarity on the terms of the agreement and its consequences in the Pacific region. Uh, the opposition is caving in their assessment of how this has all unfolded, branding it the worst Australian foreign policy blunder in the Pacific in decades. Uh, Labor's shadow foreign affairs minister Penny Wong accused the coalition of mishandling the situation, raising concerns of a potential China military presence about 1,600 kilometres from Australia in the Solomon Islands. She told ABC's AM radio, and I quote, on Scott Morrison's watch, our region has become less secure and the risks Australia faces have become much greater, Sashi. All right, and the New South Wales government was in a bit of pickle on Friday when independent MP Alex Greenwich threatened to withdraw his support for Dominic Perrottet. Yeah, pretty uh, a rare sort of uh, stoush uh, in the New South Wales Parliament. Independent member for Sydney, Alex Greenwich, warned he would no longer guarantee supply and confidence for the Liberal National Coalition government after the New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet was drawn into the debate of excluding trans and transgender people from women's sport. Greenwich is one of a handful of lower MPs the coalition relies on to govern, given Perrottet's minority government. Um, but there has been a development, Sashi, after initially doubling down the New South Wales Premier has agreed to meet Greenwich and representatives from the trans community. Um, despite the threats from Greenwich, opposition leader Chris Mins has ruled out supporting a motion of no confidence or in denying supply to the New South Wales government. Mins has said, and I quote, the choice of government should be left to the voters in March 2023. Uh, Sashi, these reports are from The Guardian and The Sydney Morning Herald. And before I let you go, Nick Hill, a quick update on the federal election campaign front. We've had our first leaders' debate last week. Yes, Sashi, it, it's going to be a very long campaign, uh, but we are less than a month away from election day, and the campaign by the two major parties, of course, the others are at full steam. Um, Labour leader Anthony Albanese, however, hit a snag after testing positive to COVID-19 last week forcing him into isolation. This means he is missing out from physically being on the hustings, particularly in those targeted marginal seats. Um, Morrison, who wished Albanese a speedy recovery, has continued his campaign and has been seen mingling with voters, again, in those marginal seats that will be crucial for both parties to either retain or win. The First leaders' debate, as you mentioned, was held last week. Uh, it was hosted by the uh, by Sky News. 
um, and such a given it was hosted by Sky News. I have taken their call on who won the debate. I think that is the burning question. Um, and according to Sky News, after an hour of questions, the 100 undecided voters in the room declared Mr. Albanese um, as, in, as having won the debate. Yes, uh, something like 40, 30, and uh, about 25% undecided uh, as well. Well, I hope while he's in isolation, the opposition leader can uh, brush up on the cash rate and the unemployment rate, Nikhil. I'm, I'm, sure, he, I'm sure he can, as Mr. Morrison would be revising the price, the price of uh, bread, milk, and a little petrol. All right, and uh, tomorrow, of course, is Anzac Day, a tribute to our diggers. Uh, yes, Ashini, I think um, a very important uh, um, uh, event in, in our calendar. Uh, the, uh, it, it is a National Day of Remembrance and uh, marking the first um, landing of the NZX at Gallipoli, um, a public holiday, and uh, there will be commemorative, uh, commemorative service, memorial services all over the country uh, tomorrow at dawn. Nikhil Singh, thank you very much for your contribution this afternoon. As always, very nicely presented. Look forward to seeing you next week in episode 18. Have a wonderful day. Thank you once again, Nikhil. Likewise, Sashi. Thank you. Cheers now. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. Please like and follow the SSTP page if you have not done so far. An important announcement before we begin with our chief guest, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, SSTP, recognizes that questioning, constructive arguments, and opinions are part of conversation, but posts with aggressive personal attacks, profanity, name-calling, swearing, defamatory in nature, and or threatening will be removed immediately, and offenders will be blocked from being part of the SSTP program. Let's observe these rules, and let's enjoy the program. There you go. That's a message to all our viewers. Now it's time to meet our chief guest on SSTP. Our chief guest is a leading economist and a prolific writer. Many of you would have read his articles in the Fiji Times and on his blog, Narsi on Fiji. Today's interview with our chief guest will throw light on the origins of the Mbani Marama government in the makings of the coups of 1987, 2000 and 2006. Today, we will look at Fiji through the lens of one USP economist who tried to contribute to his country of birth, not just academically, but through 40 years of community education in economics, politics, and social issues. He not only has continuously interacting with governments and social organizations wherever called upon, but also with military officers between the years 2000 and 2006 coup years. There's a lot to unravel this afternoon, and without further ado, Professor Wadhan Narsi, a very good afternoon, and welcome to episode 17 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Bula, Sashi. Bula. Pleased to be here. Wonderful. Now, let me begin a little differently this uh, afternoon. When you launched your book, The Challenges of Growing the Fiji Economy, <coughs> Volume 1, in 2018, you received some glowing endorsements from a number of people. For example, the late Vice President of Fiji, Ratha Chone Mandraiwiwi, said, and I quote, Wadhan expresses his fondness and affection for this country by inviting us to consider options that would ease globalization while retaining some measure of ourselves. While some of it speaks to the great and powerful, it is largely directed at people of Fiji, of all communities, those law-abiding, hard-working folk of all communities who quietly struggle and make sacrifices in the hope of a better Fiji for their children. That quote from the late Vice President of Fiji, the late Ratha Chone Mandraiwiwi. And if I may just add another quote, similarly, Fred Wesley, the editor-in-chief of the Fiji Times, wrote in his endorsement on, on your book, he said, and I quote, Professor Wadhan Narsi has a special way of addressing issues a lot of people can relate to. He makes complicated economics understandable to the average Fijian reader, a flair for writing articles that have depth 
and carry a power-packed punch. He writes what he sees and means what he says. That's from Fred Wesley. Now, well then, when you hear comments of that sort from well-known personalities, uh, editors-in-chief of major newspapers, what are your thoughts? What goes through your mind? Well, first of all, before I answer that question, Shasi, may I commend uh, Nikhil Singh on his lovely sitting room? <laughs> Mine is a converted garage, unfortunately, which is my study now. But I would also like to add my, my sentiments to you and Nikhil when you celebrated the victory of the Fijiana Drua yesterday. I'm sure there's a lot of people jumping up and down with delight. But may I actually pass a message to all girl athletes in Fiji? You have, you know, the Drua actually totally shocked the Australian public. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Their mighty Waratahs being thrashed so convincingly by, by, by the Fijiana Drua. And, you know, all girl, girl, girl athletes in Fiji, get ready for the talent scouts who are going to be coming to Fiji <laughs> to search for members to play in their teams. You know, just as they have pounced on all of our Fijian, you know, uh, rugby players, you know, uh, to play in theirs. Yeah, anyway, uh, Sashi, you know, what uh, what uh, uh, you quoted from Ratu Choni, you know, who later became a very good friend of mine, you know, uh, and, and well, Fred Wesley, Fiji Times, you know, uh, you know, except for a few censorship years in 2011 and 2014, uh, uh, Fiji Times has bravely published all of my articles, although in the last 10 years, they have paid lawyers more then they pay me to go through my article to make sure that the, that the publishers can't be kicked out of Fiji or jailed or fined $400,000. So I, I salute the Fiji Times, you know, for their courage. And of course, you know, in the last few years, I salute uh, Motibai Patel Company, you know, who own Fiji Times, who could have just given up like all the other businesses have in Fiji and just subjected themselves to censorship, but they have not done so. So, you know, I'm happy to have Fred's... Uh, positive comments, uh, and also, of course, Dr. Choni, but there's also other comments there about others. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I tell you what, and I'll speak a little bit about it later, you know, uh, you know, people are recognized by the friends they have. <laughs> you know, you know the character of people by the friends they keep. So I'm very happy to receive those endorsements, uh, Sashi. Well, uh, Fred's endorsement said he writes what he sees and means what he says. I certainly hope this afternoon you're not going to be pulling any punches and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you'll give it as good as uh, you get, I hope. All right. <laughs> <I> hope <so. laughs> let's let's move on. Now, well, then how would you describe your background? Well, to be honest, I mean, uh, uh, I, when I ask myself, you know, why am I such a multiracial person, right? I mean, I'm born in Fiji to humble Gujarati laundry parents. You know, my brother and I, right from primary school, we had to go home after school to iron for three hours in the laundry. Otherwise, my father's business would not have survived. Even my sisters, like Padma, you know, used to come and work in the laundry as well alongside the men uh, when, when ships uh, orders came in and they had to be turned around within 24 hours. So, you know, growing in, in, in Turek, you know, you, 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 you became multiracial because of all the kids who were there. I, I, our house was just in front of the Methodist church in Fiji and all the Kailoma kids there flying kites, you know, playing with tops and you know, all, the, all the usual things we kids used to do in Fiji. So it started like that. But, uh, but then, you know, of course, I, you know, we went to Marist primary and secondary schools. I don't know why my father sent us to Marist schools, you know, when people were going to uh, MGM and all that. But, you know, I went to Marist primary and secondary. And while people know me for academic work, in fact, for me, the love of my life was sports. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the soccer first level, cricket first level. I played rugby midgets. I, I loved running. I was a long distance runner. And uh, one year, I think I won the Fiji 1500 meters at uh, RKS Grounds, which had a little hut in the middle of the ground, I remember. Uh, and, and that was the year, I think, that Siti uh, Veni Rambuka won the national shot put <laughs> competition as well. So, you know, for me, the proudest thing in school was to be the Marist uh, Sportsman of the Year. And, uh, and I tell you what, the biggest shock for me, of course, not surprised, but I took the trophy home, my father threw it on the bed. And he mm. said to me, you know, of course, they used to frame all of our maths certificates and all that, right? And my father stood on the bed and said, son, sports will not fill your stomach. <laughs> right. And then a story I told later, of course, I said, well, Lote Tungiri and, you know, Vijay Singh weren't around then or else my father would have changed his tune a little bit, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, part of that whole upbringing was, uh, 
uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I was very lucky to be part of this thing they call the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. Mm-hmm. So as, as kids, you know, um, you know, well, I'm a 15-year-old kid with three other kids just armed with a compass and maps. We walk from Nandi Sambeto to, to Wunindawa to Nosori. We walk from Batukola north-south to, to Singatoka. You know, and, and well, I remember climbing as a kid, you know, climbing Joski's Thumb with Peter Drysdale, my friends, Anil Tikaram, um, Jitain Mehta, although two of our friends, they opened an, a bottle the night before. <laughs> we were in no condition <laughs> to climb Joski's Thumb the next day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I walked to Vanua Levu with my friend, John Kuvula. Later, I did great fishing, you know, with the Rajesh Chandra and Vijay Naidu. And, and best of all was with my friend, uh, uh, the late uh, Dr. Rupatengalo, who was from, who's, whose mother is from Bali. And we fished in the chiefly waters of Bau. I mean, oh, you can't imagine what fishing there is like. Of course, it's a restricted area. But, uh, you know, coming back from fishing, we'd go to, to, to his home, his uncle Mudanabitu's home, and we would sing all night with Jesse Mudanabitu. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. how great was that, you know? So I, I came to love Fijian culture, Fijian people, and the Fiji that we were all part of. I mean, and later on, you know, it went big hunting with Simeone Duratalo up in the Bukuya Highlands. Oh, did all kinds of great things. You know, to me, uh, Fiji was in my blood. You know, the great saying that people have, people can get out of Fiji, but, you know, you can't take the Fiji out of them. Well, cliche, that cliche actually totally applies to me. So, I mean, that's the thing that nobody knows from about, you know, you know, they all know me by my academic work, but, you know, the heart of it all, Uh, And what drives, you know, drove me to stay in Fiji all my working life until I was kicked out of USP, you know, was was this love of of the country. Absolute, absolute love of a country, yeah. We'll we'll come to that uh, USP saga a little bit later. Now, you've just described a whole lot of uh, wonderful memories, Um, you know, pig hunting, fishing, your (laughs) athletic prowess. Uh, What would be your earliest memory? Oh, it would have to be uh, growing up in Turek, man. you know, as kids, you know, going and playing in Marks Park, fighting with all the kids because somebody's trying to steal your ball or something, flying kites there, flying tops and things, and getting into all kinds of scrapes, you know, which our parents, of course, were very annoyed with. But basically, I grew up as a larrikin in Turek. I mean, you know, Turek, of course, at that time was a place where Sunya Dhamma ruled the roost, you know, and, and what you saw coming out of Sunya Dhamma's cafe at night, (laughs) which would make people actually cringe today. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful place. Not not like the Turek of uh, Melbourne by any means. (laughs) The opposite, in fact. So those are my earliest memories, uh, Sashi. Some great memories. And of course, uh, Turek was uh, like a city on its own, particularly at nighttime. It was a wild place. Yeah, wild place. People uh, didn't come there at night, no. (laughs) Yeah, I remember I lived in Amy Street for a while. So Amy Street is where I was born, mate. That's where I was born. So you only came at night if you wanted some... (laughs) <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you wanted some two forbidden goods, you came to came to Turek in the night. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now, um, what about your tertiary education? You also excelled in terms of education. Yeah, well, well, you know, in the year that we did New Zealand University entrance, this was before USP was there, uh, the F- Fiji government gave two unbonded scholarships. So the first one went to uh, his friend of mine, also from Turek, Manilal Jogia, who got the Commonwealth Scholarship. And I was made the Fiji Scholar which is one of the scholarship, only scholarships which was unbonded. So you could go and not come back if you if you didn't want to come back. And strangely enough, I went back after graduating uh, and worked in Fiji all my life. All of my other colleagues who got Fiji government scholarships, they served their bonds, and within 10 years, they had all emigrated. So, I, I mean, there's some kind of a story over there, you know, about... about bonds not being enough to keep you if people want to leave you know and i just i just wanted to stay so so the, i you know i went to otago university in new zealand which was an experience of its own because in the holidays you know my brother and i just to earn money we used to go and work in the freezing works where we were in contact with islanders and maoris and everybody and what a life that was in addition to the huge amount of money we made working in freezing works i mean you can't believe how we just loved that cash that came rolling in <laughs> All right. Now, I understand after studies, when you returned to Fiji, you worked in the Fiji Bureau of Statistics for a year before joining USP as a lecturer in mathematics. However, then you were drawn into economics by some radicals at USP. I've read that. How did that come about? 
Well, uh, you know, in Rama, 1973-74, there was a, a student Christian movement there, which was headed, I think, by Reverend Aquila Yambaki. Was also became a friend of, friend for life, and there was a group of people there, including the the great uh, feminist pioneer, uh, the late Amelia Rokutu Ivona, who was a director of the YWCA. I mean, she was one of the few indigenous Fijians, like uh, Reverend Justataki Kuroi, who opposed the 1987 coup, and she was brutalized even by a family member who was in the army at that time, right? And then there was John Sami, a very radical CPO economist later, who became the director of CPO. And he appears later in, you know, in my story as, as in the charter exercise. Actually, quite a brave fellow as well. Uh, you know, Johnny Dokuvula, who has always been active in Fiji. In fact, he's a fantastic intellectual of all kinds. I mean, he's a very interesting character. You could write a great story about him. But he and I, you know, we were in this group with Claire Slatter and some others, and we did a study of Fiji. At that time, it was very much dominated by Australian companies, you know, Burns Phillips and Carpenters and all that. So we call that study Fiji a developing Australian colony. And the Alliance government, of course, thought we were all communists, you know, because we went on a sleep, uh, Johnny and I, we went on a sleep, uh, speaking tour to Australia, organized by unions, Australian unions. And when we came back, they thought we were all communists. So they used to follow us around in the green vans of the special branch, <laughs> yeah, the secret service police, you know, of the, of the Rautumara government at that time. But, you know, you know, we are such a, you know, as I said, we are not just who we are in our families we're born into, but by the friends we keep through our lives. And I have been fortunate that I've had all these fantastic friends all through my life, you know, at, especially at, at USP as well, from USP, but these radical people. So, I mean, you know, that was the beginning of uh, my interest in economics, and I gradually started to study economics formally. And then for my master's, I went to Jamaica in 1976 for two years, which was a, a bit of a hellhole at that time. You know, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to that Jamaican experience yeah. in a moment. But before we get too far ahead, what was the experience at the Fiji Bureau of Statistics like for you? Well, tell you what, man, I, I, I made friends for life. I made friends for life. You know, I, in the end, I didn't like it because it was, uh, I, I hated working, you know, in this sort of 8 to 4.30 kind of a thing. But uh, I'm, I'm, there were people there who were just incredibly bright. There was one fellow who was my friend for life, uh, Kishore Chetty, who later became a deputy government statistician. I mean, who was the, one of the greatest intellectuals I've known, you know, in, in Fiji, far more intellectual than many of my USP academic friends. And there was also, of course, Tim Benimarama, who later became <laughs> government statistician. And he, he paid the price for being too honest, you know, later. Uh, so you just showed actually being a Beni Marama is, wasn't enough, you know, protection. So he, uh, later, of course, you know, 10 years later, I started doing a lot of work with the Bureau of Stats Survey data. And my goodness, all my Bureau friends, well, well, I had access to basically all the data, provided I followed all the rules of confidentiality and all that and never revealed anything about individuals and all that, right? But, oh, wow. I mean, that one year in the Bureau of Stats, uh, those friends stayed with me for 40 years, honestly. Uh, even to this day, uh, even to this day, you know, government statisticians after government statisticians, except for the last one who are too young now. Uh, but uh, it, it was, it, and it also, uh, it also drove home to me that statistics, which was the worst subject of mine, I did an honors degree in math, so started off doing that. And it was the most boring of, of su subjects. But in the end, statistics was in fact the most useful of all my subjects, you know, in all my later career as an economist. Very interesting, I thought. <laughs> Okay. Now, then in 76, and I'm now taking you back to Jamaica, yeah. against all expectation or trends, yes. you went to the University of West Indies in Jamaica, of all places, yeah. for your master's in economics degree. <laughs> I understand that the experience in Jamaica was incredible for you because you say uh, that you've learned some brutal lessons of great relevance to Fiji. Yeah well, I tell, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, the, first of all, my stupidity, there was an Indian professor of economics, Ashok Desai at USP, who got me a place in the London School of Economics with a friend of his. And I said to him, oh, I don't want to go to a developed country. I want to go to a developing country. So my friend John Sami had gone to Sussex University. Another friend, the late Jane Prakash, had went to the University of Tanganyika in, 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 you know, in Tanzania. And I said, okay, Michael Manley at that time was a great radical socialist leader. I said, let me go to Jamaica. It's an island country, sugar, tourism, just like Fiji. I might learn something there. 
where the three lessons I learned was not in the economics department, which was okay, nothing great. It had been set up by LSE in the first place. But the three lessons I learned in there was there's a political war going on there between Michael Manley's party, which was a socialist party, very highly uh, suspected by the CIA of, of having communist links with Cuba and all that, and uh, and Siaga, the, his cousin Siaga. And these two warring families, they, they basically destroyed hundreds of lives in Jamaica through their political violence. So I learned those two years in, in Jamaica, one, violence breeds violence. Two, Michael Manley's socialist planning, however well-intentioned, was disastrous for the poorest people in the country. And third, you know, uh, uh, what I found was that the ruthless political leaders, you know, they will do the propaganda a bit, you know, in, in front of others in the media and all that. So like Mike, uh, uh, Bob Marley sang in, in live in the Kingston football arena, and I was lucky to be there when he first sang One Love. And mm -hmm. Michael Manley and Siaga, they hugged each other on, on stage for the followers' benefit. One week later, they were killing each other again. And, you know, it, it forever, forever, I mean, uh, warned me to be wary of ruthless uh, politi polit politicians who, who lose their morals. And uh, those three lessons, of course, you can't read through big books. You know, you have to be there to, to understand it. I mean, and, and, and I, I certainly did learn those three very, very, um, you know, strong lessons. And in Fiji later on, of course, when people thought they should, you know, uh, uh, react to the 87 coup with violence, I just said, no, no way. And I stayed well away with those, from some of those friends. And of course, they've been in the news, in the news media recently. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. Okay. You then returned to Fiji and you went back to teaching economics again. I understand some of your mm. students are very well known today and some are still very active in politics. Uh, who oh, yes, were some yes. of your students? Yeah, well, I tell you, one of the things about, you know, when USP was a new university, we had a great lot of quality students come through, especially a lot of people, older people who never had a chance to go to university in Australia and New Zealand. But, you know, there were outstanding people like uh, Ganesh Chan, Bhiman Prasad, Usamate, and uh, even a certain prominent businesswoman <laughs> who, who used to praise me, you know, 20 years ago for the gender economics I taught in my courses for the first time, of course. And she later tried to sue me because of what I had uh, written about the, the wastage of taxpayers' money in the railway dairy restructuring. So uh, I've had the privilege of teaching thousands of economics graduates around the university. Some of them in Tonga and Samoa and Solomons have done brilliant things, you know. So, I mean, I am the lucky one because, you know, they came into the class and they interreacted and, you know, they brought their own ideas uh, with them. And, of course, lecturers learn as much from their students as students learn from lecturers. So, I mean, it was it was a great, great time for me, you know, that, that period, 78 to 81, yeah. Well said. Um, um, you then traveled to the UK and did your PhD in Sussex University, UK. But your PhD thesis, I believe, took some years. And interestingly, <laughs> recently, your book was published by UK publishers, uh, Palgrave Macmillan. Please yes. explain this period of your life, uh, especially the work involved in the thesis yes. and the late publication of your book. Uh, well, what happened was I went to, to, you know, I went to Sussex on the advice of my friend John Sami. His name keeps coming up all the time. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, IDS, in, in, uh, you know, was, was a very, very prominent uh, development place in the world at that time. And I went there to do my PhD on Fiji's money and banking system. Very straightforward thesis. If I had stuck to it, I would have finished in three years and come back, right, with a PhD. But uh, during my study, I just found that the existing theories were just totally inadequate in explaining what was really happening in Fiji. And then I went and investigated the colonies in West Indies, found more questions, colonies in uh, in, in Africa, more questions. Colo you know, India, which was, of course, was also a colony, although so special on its own because of its massive size. And, and I was doing this research in the public records office in Kew Gardens in London, which has the records of the entire British Empire. You can't believe what a treasure house it is of, of historical stuff. Were you talking from what actually happened? What were governors saying? What were civil servants saying in London and, 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 in, and in Fiji and in Solomons and in India and all that? So my, my, my PhD, without my, me telling my supervisors, who would have been wild if they had not found out, it just extended into a huge thing called the British imperialism and the making of colonial currency systems. 
And the core of it was that I established, you know, in four or five chapters on each part of the British Empire, how Britain used colonial gold reserves in London to strengthen sterling, you know, the British currency as the center of London and the world's financial system at the time. You know, a phenomenal thing that was happening. And a lot of, of economists, you know, historians could never understand how a small country on the coast of, of, of Europe could be could have a world empire, which they did. It's a big story, of course, right? But anyway, uh, I, I finished the thesis and I had a contract in 1990 to publish with Macmillan. By this time, I had got involved in Fiji politics and all that. And I put my book on, on, a, on, a, on the back burner. I tried to get back to it after 2000. By that time, Macmillan had changed hands and they weren't interested. And then around about 2014 or something, right? Uh, I suddenly got contacted by this professor from the United States, you know, Professor Larry Meal, uh, Larry Neal, uh, who is a world authority on the history of capitalism. And he says, hey, I've come across your, your thesis book. He says, this is phenomenal. I've never known about this. You should get it published. So he actually pushed and he helped me to get it published through uh, 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 Belgrave Macmillan in, uh, in, in Britain. And there's the book there which nobody in Fiji reads and nobody cares about, not even the economists at USP will have read it. And the sad thing, of course, is bloody thing, if you look it up on the on the internet, it's selling for $300. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who's going to buy this book? You know, I mean, I think I made a mistake. I should have published with Z Press, you know, which would have actually had a cheaper price and it would have been bought all over the world. But at that time, you know, beggars can't be choosers. You know, I was, I thought it was a miracle that somebody wanted to see my book published. I did get it published. And, and when it was published, one of the biggest praises for it in Fiji was Professor Rajesh Chandra, who had booted me out. <laughs> so it was published in 2016, right? And in 2011, Rajesh had booted me out from university, you know, We're claiming I didn't that. have enough international publications. <laughs> But this is the irony of life. Uh, what can you say? You know, but well, you know, to, to me, it's my contribution to international knowledge. You know, and all the rest of my stuff is, is about Fiji, right? But this is has put USP on the map, Fiji on the map, and it's put me on the map. And of course, after I kick the bucket, they will steal. In fact, even now, I mean, every almost every year, people, international researchers, contact me. You know about this book and say, oh, can you explain to us why you're saying this, why you're saying that? You know, because they're researching something else somewhere else in the world, and so it is of interest internationally, not in Fiji. But you know, it's okay. Who cares? You know, I I, well, I enjoyed it. I spent seven years of my life on it. Can you believe seven years of my intellectual life on it? Yeah, but I've also spent the rest of the time on Fiji. And you know, I tell you about Sashi. A certain well-known academic in Australia, everybody knows his name, he used to keep telling me all the time, you know, why don't you wasting your life in USP and in Fiji? Why don't you come and join a big university like ANU or something? Well, I tell you what, man, I've had so much delight in working at USP and in Fiji. I wouldn't give it up for anything, you know. And it's a, it was a young university. It was starting off. People like Professor Biman Prasad and I, and today people like Nilesh Gounder and them, they are helping, you know, to keep it on the web, on the map, you know, as a great university. It's our university. It's what we created. 40, 50 years ago, universities in Australia and New Zealand have been there for 200 years. You know, how can anybody compare us to them? USP was not a barren, arid environment. It was a fantastic environment. You know, it's, it's what you choose to make it, Sashi. You know, nobody can hand you a, 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 a status, you know, on a plate. You have to make that status. Absolutely. And uh, congratulations on the publication of that uh, British imperialism and uh, and uh, colonial currencies. Yeah, uh, well, I won't tell you how much I won't tell you how much uh, royalties I get from it every year. Okay? No, I'm not going to ask you, you that. You might laugh. <laughs> All right. Uh, then uh, you returned to Fiji, started yeah. writing on national economic issues and also contributing to national politics again. But this time with the Fiji Labour Party. Well, and I that guess that association, did, yeah. that association didn't last long, did it? <laughs> well, I, 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 it wasn't starting with the Labour Party. I, I wrote an opinion piece on the Fiji Times called, you know, which, which criticized the airlines government's uh, uh, wage freeze. You know, so, it, so Mahendra Chaudhary, you know, asked me to go and speak at the Labour Party, uh, not the Labour Party, at the FTUC biennial conference 
to and give a paper on what was wrong with it and all that. So there were there were two people who came, who went and delivered papers at that biennial conference, myself and my former student and later colleague, Simeona Duratalo. And what we basically argued for was that uh, what Fiji needed and Fiji's workers needed, you know, uh, were, were not more economic arguments like the kind that, you know, I was making, but a new Labour Party which could put into effect, you know, the philosophy of protecting workers and their wages. And as it's interesting, you know, just two months ago, Mr. Felix Anthony invited me to speak at the biennial conference at the, in, in Suva. I, I don't know whether it's taken place or not, but uh, that was my starting point. And I worked together with uh, Mandra Chaudhry. He said we, I was a founding member of the Fiji Labour Party. I was made chairman of the policy committee. And during that period in the run-up to the election, suddenly our leadership was changing policies without asking us. And, uh, and in, a, in an executive committee, you know, I said, look, why are you announcing all these nationalizations, you know, the emperor gold mines and all that? You know, you, you, you don't need to do all those things. And you don't need to announce them. You'll only attract the, the you know, the, the bad attention of the U.S. CIA. Well, Mr. Chaudhry, uh, uh, and he talked to Mr. Bavandra and uh, they looked at me and uh, Mr. Chaudhry pointed to the door <laughs> and said, so what if you don't like it? And there's the door. So I looked at my colleagues to the left, to the right. They were all looking on the floor. So I got up and I left and I didn't go back. But, uh, you know, that, that, that policy of nationalization of the gold mines came to bite them, you know, later. But uh, that was how I started off. Actually, I, I did I did start to try to contribute to the Labour Party. But uh, you know, uh, you know, when I was you know when I was forced to go, I thought, oh well, what does it does it matter? I'm not only one person, right? But you know, gradually over the years, virtually everybody, you know, in the Labour Party, Vijay Naidu, Claire Slater, Atu Bain, Krishna Dutt, all the thinking people gradually left the Labour Party, including Satyendra Prasad, who is now working for the Beni Marama government. So, I mean, it, there was a pattern to it in that some political leaders, you know, they just cannot tolerate independent uh, opinion under underneath them. And, you know, it's like the giant tree, you know, which will not tolerate growth under the under itself. Well, you know, there's no future for it. One day it topples over. Okay, well, um, have a little break uh, and uh, we will come back and we talk about the 1987 coup. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest this afternoon is Professor Wadhan Narsi, leading economist and a prolific writer. Please share the SSTP page and this interview with family and friends if you can. Don't forget to like and follow the SSTP page as well. Now, Wadhan, let's uh, turn back the clock. The 1987 coup shocked the nation and also shock, uh, shook up lives of many USP academics as well. Now, I understand you protested also and uh, spent a night in the prison cells. Yeah, well, that's a small sacrifice to pay. But to be honest, you know, my, some of our colleagues like Dr. Anirudh, Anirudh Singh and Dr. Som Prakash were actually brutalized. Vijay Naidu was thrown into the cells as well. You know, and for us, I mean, uh, we, I just remember that one of the hotspots around the country was near Vatukola, where the roadblocks were put up. And with the support, we believe, of the Emperor Gold Mines, you know, who, of course, didn't want to be nationalized by the Labour Party. So, I mean, you know, when we protested the coup, we kept on protesting for a year, you know, and in, in 88 in the Sukuna Park, there were 18 of us who were arrested by the police and spent the night in, in the cell. There were Vijay Naidu, Atu Bain, Imrana Jalal, Arlene Griffin, some Catholic priests, and also, <laughs> incidentally, a young fellow by the name of Ayaz Kayum. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, so, that, and Justice Devendra Patik found us all guilty of assembly, <laughs> but the conviction was suspended, you know, but uh, oh, what could you do? I mean, you know, you had to stand up for it. And, you know, all my friends like Amelia, Roku Kivuna, John Adekuvola and others, you know, we opposed, we continued to oppose it through organizations, you know, as well. So it is true that Ayaz Kayum did take part in the protests and was arrested and spent a night uh, in custody. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Actually, Ayaz Kayum and Riyaz Kayum were my good friends in those years. He used to invite me and my wife, you know, to the, to the, to the Ramadan things, you know, at, at home in their homes and all that. We're good buddies then, uh, especially okay. Riaz. <laughs> now, in your opposition to the 1987 coup, I believe you continue to associate with progressive groups like the 
Citizens Constitutional Forum. What was this experience like? Well, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I mean, it was a great time to be, you know, uh, to be with progressive people. It was led by people like Reverend Aquila Yambaki, Abalia Rukutu Ivuna, Vijay Naidu, Satyan Prasad, Claire Sletter, Father Kevin Bard, David Arms, Tessa McKenzie. I mean, there's a whole lot of them, right? Including the, the late uh, 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 Meli Vesikula, you know, who just passed away recently, right? You know, uh, and, and they organized workshops and seminars and public lectures. We worked works on, on scholarship. We were all argued for an end to the racism against Indo-Fijians, right? In scholarship, in voting, in civil service appointments and promotions and all that. I mean, people people really cared about the fact that Indo-Fijians were being, you know, you know, marginalized from from civic society life. So for me, it was a pleasure to be working with them. Although, of course, it was a dangerous occupation as well. You know, at, at USP, we were not, uh, you know, looked upon kindly for b doing this kind of work, and I was denied promotion. I mean, people like Vijay and I were denied promotion for years and years. You know, whereas if you collaborated with everybody, you know, then then they moved up the ladder. So, I mean, you know, it was it was an interesting time, and as as I said to you, well, our friends also helped to define us. True. Okay, I I see from your books and community education writings that you continued your work in writing on development issues, like uh, for instance, indigenous Fijian education, uh, on uh, population, government budgets. You also did a massive project for the World Bank. What was this about, Wadhan? Uh, this was a huge six-country study with, a, with an Australian fellow, Ian, Ian Morris and I. We did right around the Pacific, you know, on Solomon's, Vanuatu, Fiji, Kiribati. We traveled everywhere twice, you know, in a period of 18 months. Massive thing for World Bank. And at the end of it all, we published it. The World Bank actually invited the e and I to go and join them in Washington. Ian did go and he had a fantastic career with them. Uh, I declined because, you know, my wife had a very good job at the USP uh, library. Our children were at school and they were very happy at school. And I, you know, I, I didn't particularly see the need to make more money and have status. So I, so I, I didn't go. But uh, on the basis of that work around the Pacific, I also became the director of planning and development at USP in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, that was fantastic for me because I initiated the work on the marine studies complex and got that built, the AusAid Lecture Theater. I did a lot of analysis on, on USP, including its financing, <laughs> you know, the issues that are going on currently at USP. Well, I can tell you a few things about all that, but also about academic standards at USP and how, you know, why Fijians were not doing as well as Indo-Fijians and others. So I did a lot of writing on Fijian education, on population issues, government budgets, and so on. And uh, that uh, that initial experience with the with the World Bank, you know, was was very very good because it also exposed me to the Pacific Island countries, you know, and, and I did more and more work with them all over the, over these years, including I mean, I've continued that. And recently, I did a big work piece of work for uh, a, a Pacific community uh, on the financing of education in the Solomon Islands. So, I mean, uh, I think those practical experiences uh, shaped me as an academic to focus more on people's development needs rather than doing academic publications for international journals, which nobody reads, nobody cares about. But to me, this work trying to make a difference to our people's lives and leaving it behind for them. You know, so, you know, my volume one came out, you know, two years ago and I haven't had the energy to to do the, the other three volumes. But uh, those other three volumes are almost there. My next one is on a fair go for all Fiji, which focuses on the, the struggles by workers, by women, by pensioners and other marginalized groups, you know, for, for justice in the world. And my third one will be on social issues that I've written about. And my fourth one will be on political issues, including a big section on media censorship. So that's all sort of coming. And basically, my this is the last things for me to do in my life is to put together all my stuff that I've written and put it in print and leave it so that the younger generation can learn from it. I mean, nobody's going to pay me for it. And in fact, for my first volume, uh, it almost went into a lost situation. People don't buy books. You know, mm -hmm. they spend $50 on a meal, you know, in a restaurant, but they won't buy a book from which their children can learn from, from for life. So one of the sad things about Fiji, you know, and people who do not value 
value books but anyway that, that's not our, that's not my problem my problem my, my problem is to is to leave it there and leave it for posterity and whether anybody appreciates it or not well it's neither here nor there you do what you think is right for yourself at a point in time you know judgment of others does not really matter great great philosophy for life uh, i hope your volume 2 is published soon because uh, the the topic that you have uh, for volume 2 is uh, absolutely important in terms of Fiji today, as, oh, as Fiji is. heads towards the election. So I hope is, your yeah. volume two comes out soon, Wadden. Yeah, it is for workers' rights. I mean, you know, they've been undermined by the Benemarama government. It's never, ever before. Our poor unionist friends have suffered, I can tell you. Oh, Tapers, I wouldn't like to be a unionist in Fiji, man. Yeah. All right, now let's move our discussions uh, to politics again. Your initial political affiliation was with the Fiji Labour Party, yeah. where you were a founding member, and as you've told us this afternoon, you were shown the door. Then uh, you were asked to leave. <laughs> However, another opportunity arose for you when in 1996, Mr. J. Ram Reddy invited you to go into politics again, this time for the NFP. How did this opportunity arise? <laughs> well, what, one day it was a prize because I had often been critical of the NFP, right, on the wage freeze and all that. Uh, Mr. Reddy rang me up and said, look, we're trying to convert Rambuka and change the constitution. Come and help and do something concrete, Warden, instead of firing pot shots at us all the time with your newspaper articles. It's all very good being an academic. Why don't you come and do something, you know? So what he did, he said there was a by-election in the Suva constituency and he says, come and stand here. So, you know, I went and stood and had a bit of a few blocks on the way, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, in the end, I had to sacrifice, I had to, I had to resign from USP. My good job at USP, uh, you know, as an as a, a associate professor or whatever, and go and become a backbencher in parliament uh, at $18,000 a year. <laughs> wow. you know, of course, I was a shadow finance minister, but you don't get any anything for that. And I served for three years in parliament. And that's not enough to qualify for you for a pension. So, you know, I, I got nothing else out of it afterwards. But I got an absolute lesson, you know, in, in what was important in people's lives. You know, all the bread and butter issues and all that. And, you know, I worked with SBT and, well, we, I was unopposed because Labour Party did not put up a candidate against me. I mean, I was still friends with all these fellows, you know, Krishna Dad, even Mahin Chaudhry, you know. And 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 we and in Parliament, I worked together with SVT and Labour Party, including Mahin, Krishna Dad, everybody. We 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 supported SVT when the need was there, and we opposed them when the need was there. And we did get the 1997 Constitution passed, which to me, you know, is a remarkable thing. There's no military dictator in the world anywhere. Whatever whatever may have been Rambuka's role, you know, elsewhere behind the scenes and all that, but no military dictator in the world willingly gives up the possibility of power and the potential for power by changing a biased constitution in which he was guaranteed victory all the time to bring in a, a constitution like that, you know, and, and his SVT colleagues were not happy with him. And mm -hmm. later, you know, he paid the price, Rambuka paid the price, but, but uh, you know, he, he carried the day. The 97 constitution was passed by both houses of parliament, right? You know, un you know, unanimously. And so it was, it is the ultimate constitution of Fiji. And in my belief, I think, you know, maybe later we can talk about it. It, it is still the valid constitution. No other thing ca has, has replaced it. We will definitely talk about uh, the constitution uh, as well. But still staying with the 1997 constitution, you've just said that, uh, it was passed, but I understand you did not agree with everything in the 19, 1997 constitution. Yeah, I, I didn't, you know, because I, I actually tried very hard to educate my brother-in-law, who at the time was staying with me during the Reeves Commission thing, you know, that the electoral system that they were wanting to go with was, was, was terribly flawed. You know, it was not proportional. You know, I mean, it, it is it is a democracy, of course. And you know, when you, you accept the rules and you and you abide by the rules, even if they're unfair to you, it happens in Australia, by the way. You know, Sashi, there are people who get elected, you know, on very small proportion numbers of votes, right, because of the preference system, right. Whereas in Senate, of course, it's all proportional here. But uh, you know, we were in a hurry to get that constitution approved. And just the Jeremy already said, look, let's not quibble about little bits like the electoral system. Anything happens, the courts will sort it out. 
Well, unfortunately, the electoral system came to bite us. And, you know, in, in, the NFP was totally wiped out in the 99 elections. It was not proportional. And it, but if you do not win, at least if you do not win 50% of the votes in any one seat, you just do not get elected, full stop. Even though nationally, you might have 30% of the votes. So we mm -hmm. were wiped out. And sadly, SVT was also wiped out because Ratumara's uh, 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 sponsored party, you know, uh, the VLV, the Fundamentalist Party, had uh, Andi Koila Mara standing for it and Ratu Ipeli Ganilao standing for it. And, you know, they took away enough uh, seats from the uh, uh, from the SVT to enable Fiji Labour Party to win. And so they got more than uh, eight seats. They got eight seats. So they were entitled to be in cabinet, right? But, but you know, what happened was, to me, the 97 constitution had a valuable element which the Reeves report did not have. And that was the multi-party government provision. If you got more than 10% of the seats, you're entitled to be invited into cabinet. And SVT was entitled to be in cabinet. I know at that time, if you go through Hansard, you'll know that uh, the Labour Party was arguing that we should have had more communal seats because of our population numbers. Well, that was true, of course. But to me, what was more important was to be sh you know, sharing in government, in cabinet. Not having you know more representatives in parliament who just sit there and you know can basically do nothing. So to me, having that multi-party government thing was so so important. And FLP at that time was claiming, oh, NFP has sold out the Indo-Fijians. I mean, same kinds of arguments are being made today about the NFP. You know, you're selling out people, selling out Indo-Fijians. Well, hey, look in this country, the, in the indigenous Fijians, you know, have 65, 67 percent of the population. Indo-Fijians now have about 30 percent of the population. Your leaders have to work together with the leaders of the indigenous Fijian party, whoever they are, whoever they select, right? If you want to have a say in government, or else you're forever on the outside looking in and and and, and firing pot shots, as, as, as J. Ram accused me of. <laughs> but, you know, uh, anyway, unfortunately, they were after the 99 election, uh, things did not work out as, you know, I would have liked to have hoped, either for NFP or for SVT. Now, uh, talking about that uh, multi-party government provision, I believe you were privy to a discussion where Mr. Rambuka made an offer. <laughs> yes. Well, Can you, you know, elaborate on that? Yeah, well, there's a funny thing. You know, I mean, I was interested in golf. Uh, I, still, I still am, as was Rambuka. Before the 99 election, you could go to the Fiji Golf Club. You couldn't get a game with Rambuka. Even he invited me once to play with him. I went there. You play in groups of four, of course. Couldn't get a, a look in because there's about 20 people like bees, you know, all around Ramboka, mm. right? Uh, straight after the 99 election, he is there on his own. And he said to me, hey, what, let's go and play golf, mate. He said, I, I've gone from hero to zero <laughs> in <Nice>. one day. <laughs> now we were on the course. And uh, by this time, I had known what the results were going to be like, you know, because the writing was on the wall. I was there the first few days of counting. You could see what was happening. So I just gave up and went to play golf. And uh, on the 10th tee, on the middle of the 10th, uh, you know, Ramuka got a phone call. Uh, and from the way he was talking, it was from Mr. Chaudhry. And I was I was amazed and shocked at, at how humble Ramuka was. And he said to Mr. Chaudhry, he said, sir, I'll serve in any any portfolio you choose. Maybe even in a, in a, even in a what do you call them, uh, the, the visiting minister, whatever, that, you know, the... The roving, roving, minister. roving, roving minister kind yes. of thing, right? And yeah. you know, apparently, uh, Jim Akwe imposed too many conditions on them, and uh, and Mahin Chaudhry and and the SVT could not come to an agreement, and uh, in a, and Mahin Chaudhry did not include them in the multi-party government. And some people believe that Ratumara may have, may have had an influence because Rambuka once stood against Rokotui Draketi, who was Rambu uh, Maratumara's wife, and defeated her for the presidency, for a commoner to defeat a high chief. I mean, that was sacrilege, you know, for for the chiefs. And so uh, Mr. Red, uh, Mr. Chaudhry declined to have SVT in. And, uh, oh, well, I tell you what, there is an opportunity that was missed because I think Ratu Inoke, Rambuka, they were all ready to work with Mr. Chaudhry as Prime Minister. Mr. Chaudhry wasn't going to play ball. But you still try to help uh, Chaudhry and the FLP. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I did. You know, I mean, uh, when in, in uh, he was, uh, 
Chaudhary appointed me on the FNPF Investment Committee, which was very interesting because we were running the FNP Investment Committee very tightly, very well at that time. And also the NBF Asset Managed Bank Committee. You may remember the NBF, when it went broke, it was broken up into two banks, the bad bank and the good bank. Well, the bad bank was left with all the assets and, and my committee was, not my committee, the committee was I was on, was trying to get back all the money from all these bad debtors. So I actually could see, uh, I know who all the bad debtors were and how much money they owed. And whatever people may say about indigenous Fijians, you know, uh, uh, screwing the National Bank of Fiji, the biggest bad debtors were Indo-Fijian companies. And some of them, I mean, uh, they owed more than $10 million. They took off and they and their families set up supermarkets in Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne and all that, right? I mean, I'm sure people know who they are, right? But anyway, by the, you know, in the middle of all these deliberations, the 2000 coup happened. Okay, so yeah. are you actually trying to suggest perhaps that uh, if the SVT and the FLP after the 2000 coup, if, if they had come together, perhaps uh, the 2000 coup may not have uh, taken place? Oh, I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I think uh, what I saw of, uh, of uh, the SVT at that point in time, you know, in the run-up to the 99 elections, right, people like Ratu Inoke Kumbumbola, who everybody knows, has supported, you know, uh, virtually every coup in Fiji, right, including the 2006 coup. He, he took me campaigning, you know, all over Fiji. Uh, Ratu Sakusa Makutu, you know, took me to his uh, area uh, where he had me as a chief guest, uh, uh, you know, while he opened some electricity for a village, which, of course, all voted against him or something afterwards, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, me and my family were staying in this incredibly luxury accommodation in the Fijian hotel where Ratu Sakusa Makutu, of course, was a shareholder, right? And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they all were happy to have us, you know, working together with them. So, you know, I think SVT would have been willing to work as a, even as a junior partner, but that opportunity went, uh, went begging. And the 2000 coup, well, you know, if you look at who all the people were who were, uh, you know, organizing the meetings in the 2000 coup, oh, well, we'll come to that later when you talk about the military coup culture, Sashi. Yes, but, I you will, know, it, certainly. It was a lot of widespread. But, you know, after the hostages were released, I tried to get the SVT and FLP together in dialogue, right? so that they could actually form a government of national unity or something. But the first meeting was at USP. It was attended by Ratu Inoke Kumbumbola. And Chaudhary refused to attend. And he sent Krishna Dutt and Tupeni Bamba. See, Chaudhary never sent one person from the Labour Party. He always sent two people, one to keep an eye on the other one, right? And it, when, 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 took, when, when Chaudhary didn't come, Ratu Inoke went away. Then I organized a second one at the New Zealand High Commissioner's house, uh, uh, Tia Barrett. And again, Ratu Inoke came, but uh, Chaudhary refused to come and he sent Jackie Kurui and uh, Krishna Dutt this time, right? So Ratu Inoke left in total disgust. And soon after, Beni Marama, there were a lot of things happening behind the scenes. He refused to reinstate Chaudhary's government, but appointed the Garase interim government, which later became formally elected in the 2001 elections, you know. But, uh, you, know, uh, I, you know, the thing is that when Chaudhary had refused uh, SVT to be part of his multi-party government, what Garasi did was tit for tat in 2001. He gave uh, Chaudhary a very minor portfolios and Mr. Chaudhary, you know, rightly refused, you know, because they were just tokenism, right? But, you know, if only some leaders had been honest enough and humble enough to cooperate from, with, with, you know, for the good of Fiji, like Mr. J. Ram Reddy had always been, willing to cooperate, whatever he said, you know, in the 1970s, like Ratu Mahara will open anything, including a toilet to get boats, right? Well, he had changed by the time he was in parliament in 1990s. And he was a very humble person who was willing to, to swallow all the pride and everything else and work together with the leaders of the indigenous Fijian party. And Fiji could have been different if we had more Indo-Fijian leaders like that, you know? And I see... I'll take you, I'll take you on that point. You yeah. just said that Fiji could have been different. So yes. do you in fact think that had Mr. Chaudhry participated in the planned dialogue session that you had organized, yes. not once, but twice, yes. that, the political, that the political landscape could have been different in Fiji? I mean, it seems that there was room for compromise and working together in unity. How would you respond to, to that? Oh, I totally agree with you on that, you know, because, you know, Whatever you may say about the coups and all that, you know, Ratu Inoke Kumbumbola 
after the 1990 election, when when uh, when when SVT lost, Ratu Inoke Kumbumbala replaced uh, Rambuka as as uh, as uh, head of uh, SVT. Mm -hmm. You know, and and when he came to the meeting, you know, he, he was ready to compromise. I mean, he was ready to set up, you know, you know, a, a joint government. I think, you know, uh, you know, in in that in that period after the 2000 coup. Uh, but you know, Mr. Chaudhary wasn't a kind, you know, who will. Who, he had other plans, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think he, whatever plans he had, you know, it, it didn't come, it didn't bring about the right outcomes for Fiji. Okay. Now, well, then, is it true that you also helped out with the Ngarese government between? 2001 and 2006. Yeah, I mean, yeah, full. I mean, why not? I mean, you know, I, whatever people may say, you know, they, they were listening. They used to listen. So, you know, Finance Minister Yavala Kumumbala, you know, who is Inoke's brother, right, mm -hmm. a, a former governor of the Reserve Bank, he appo appointed me to the FERCA board. And, and I was there for one whole year until, you know, I resigned on principle because the management was doing some things which I found, uh, you know, objectionable. And uh, when I objected, uh, they expressed their unhappiness with me and uh, lack of confidence in me. So I resigned and went, right? But uh, I, I gave, at that time, I was doing a lot of work on poverty analysis and all that. And I and I gave a submission, I gave a presentation to Garas's cabinet, right? Uh, which uh, which was about uh, about the basis of poverty in Fiji. You know, at that time, the stats indicated that in terms of the incidence of poverty, right, which is the percentage of people who are below the poverty line, Indo Fijians were the most poor. You know, especially in rural areas where the sugarcane industry was collapsing, right. And but in terms of numbers of poor, the numbers there were far more Indigenous Fijians who were poor in terms of numbers than. Indo Fijians. Of course, the situation is even worse now. So, on the basis of numbers and how much poverty alleviation resources you had to give to people, you had to give more resources to indigenous Fijians. So, affirmative action policies were fine. But you could not ignore the Indo Fijians who were the most poor. So, you had to actually, if you serve people on need alone, not on ethnicity, you would address the problem of poverty. That's what I argued to Garase cabinet. And he was willing to, to listen to all that, you know. Uh, whatever people may say, you know, uh, about his uh, his bias towards indigenous Fijians, well, I mean, to be honest, uh, Bukhsaji, as an economist or any sensible people looking at Fiji, you'd have to say, goodness gracious, you know, this is the country of indigenous Fijian. Look around at it and who owns all the big corporations? Before Fijian holdings came along, it was all, you know, whites from abroad and Gujaratis and local Indian. Who owns all the shops everywhere? Who owns all the professional, you know, practices and things? I mean, indigenous Fijians are a very marginalized economic group in Fiji. So if Garase wants to help them, and, and I actually wrote a, 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 a paper for him when he was being charged in court. And I said, you know, in Fiji, you need to make rich Fijians richer. Mm -hmm. However bad it might sound politically. But if you want to close the gap between indigenous Fijians and others, you've got to make rich Fijians richer. You know, and that's not a crime. But, you know, for, for, for a lot of people who wanted to attack Garase, they saw it as as as, as a crime, you know, and, and I actually just didn't agree with that. So, I mean, I, the, the, the data that is there in the Bureau of Stats, and sadly, you know, it's been stopped from issuing data on ethnicity now until very recently, when the poor government statistician was sacked because he showed, you know, the data on poverty, which showed how poor indigenous Fijians now are. And I believe actually the data is not all that good. I think the, the indigenous Fijians are even more poor than what that data is showing, right? Uh, for reasons I, you know, statisticians know. But uh, you know, Garas, the government was willing to learn, to listen. You know, and and it, it is astonishing to me that you know in 2006 uh, he was in multi-party government with the Labour Party. Chaudhary didn't join, of course. But, you know, he had his other reasons. But there was Krishna Dath and everybody else there together with him in government. And nobody could accuse those Labour Party people of being corrupt or anything. So it was a wonder to me when, when Beni Marama did the coup, claiming, oh, I'm going to clean out the corruption. Uh, I'm going to come back to um, to discuss poverty, etc., and particularly the, the ethnic divide in a short while. Yeah. But uh, during this period, you wrote massively on things like economic justice and just wages for workers and, and poverty for civil society organizations like ECREA, ECREA. 
Yeah. How were you able to get access to data, for example? Well, at, at that time, I mean, this this study was uh, was led, to, you know, was initiated by uh, Father Kevin Barr, who was working for ECRIA at that time. Chantel Khan was the head of that that organization, and Father Kevin Barr was really the heart and soul driving that organization forward. But Kenneth Zink, who was a Labour minister at that time, you know, he allowed me full access to all the Ministry of Later Labour data, fantastic amount there. You know, I mean, they're just sitting there all over the departments of Labour, and nobody had analysed them. And he also gave me access to 30 years of uh, minutes of these these these, uh, these things called wages councils. Now, you know, uh, you've recently had this minimum wages hoo-ha in Fiji, right? All a lot of nonsense because you can't impose one minimum wages on Fiji, different, you know, you know, sectors and all that. You can't ask, ask ball boys, you know, uh, bottle boys to be paid the minimum wage. When, you know, all that will happen is they'd all be sacked and told to go home and the bottles would lie around everywhere in Fiji. So the wages councils were a mechanism. We had separate wages councils for manufacturing, for garments, for, for this, for that, where you set minimum wages in accordance with that sector. And, 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 you know, they had been working very badly. So for 30 years, uh, the, these, 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 these wages council things had gone very badly because uh, employers' representatives had always managed to get it postponed, always said, oh, the times are bad, we can't afford to pay the increases according to the cost of living. So over 30 years, workers in Fiji, their real wages fell behind the cost of living, you know, for 30 years. If you only get half the, the the percentage of the CPI increase, of course, you know, 20 years time, you know, it'll be about 50% of where you should be. So I, I looked at 30 years of minutes of all these wages councils and showed exactly how the workers' wages were slipping behind. It was an empirical study, right? And I also got got information from the Bureau of Stats, which they all have, all because they do an annual employment survey in the Bureau of Stats, and you get fantastic information. You know, the fundamental thing was, that none of the employers ever showed their accounts to the Ministry of Labor to show, look, I'm doing so badly, I can't pay. Never did that. So anyway, I, uh, with the support of Kenneth Zink, the Minister of Labor, uh, Father Kevin Barr, I did this incredible study and I published this book uh, called... Uh, <coughs> it's called uh, Just Wages in Fiji. Uh, I can just show that, right? But, you know, it was launched by uh, Ratu Choni Manrai Wiwi and, uh, and uh, all the union leaders supported it, right? Ministry of Labor people supported it. And it, and it basically set up uh, Father Kevin Barr as the one chairman of all the wages councils. So the wages councils had different members drawn from that industry and unions, but he was the one chairman and he had the powers, all kinds of powers, including he could say to employers, right, you say you can't uh, grant the wage increase, show us your books and show me the books. The other people in the wages council don't have to see it, but the chairman has to see it. And if you don't want to show it to me, show it to the minister. Okay. None of them ever did that. And what happened, of course, is that when he started to work, it, it became quite effective. Then these the people got into a panic and there were government manufacturers calling me from overseas. You know, I was in Fiji then. They said, hey, tell your, tell your friend, the father bar to lay off, you know, or else we're going to sack all these workers and things, you know. Well, of course, you know, none of them showed their accounts and these manufacturers and all that, they eventually, the bad ones, I mean, I mean they're good ones like in Fiji, like, you know, Mark Hallaby's, you know, outfit, they pay better than minimum wages. They have daycare for the mother's children and all that. So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the other ruthless ones. Uh, and and they they went to and got other the years of other more powerful people in the Benimarama government. And these wages councils orders began to be postponed year after year. And one day, Father Ba, you know, said in public, I am tired of this crony capitalism, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. crony capitalism, you know, of the government. It is, they listen to their special, you know, businessmen, friends and all that. So next thing you know, uh, he's being, he's rung up by a very powerful person in the Beni Marama government. I won't tell you his name. Everybody knows. And he was threatened. There was a few choice words told to him and he was told to pack his bags and get ready. So he, of course, you know, he's an Australian citizen. You know, he wanted to stay in Fiji. If his visa was rescinded, then of course he he would have to leave Fiji, which he loved. You know, he genuinely loved. So he then apologized, and there was a lot to stay. But he was removed as the chairman of the Wages Council, 
and and all that collapsed and then the government did all these idiotic things mahen reddy issued a minimum wage which he went back on a month later uh, johnny osamata issued a minimum wage which he went back on a month later this this guy from sydney was brought in and he issued a minimum wage and nobody knows whether anybody ever followed these minimum wages or not and you know and, and the guy has come again you know and issued another one and of course nobody knows whether anybody will follow that but uh, you know but i did as far as i'm concerned i, I did all that work uh, i was given full access to the bureau of stats by the government statistician then uh, mr tim benimarama wonderful fellow wonderful guy very honest very decent and he refused to bow down to people in the benimarama government in in particular to one particular individual and eventually mm-hmm. you know he was uh, forced to resign sadly the poor boy you know poor boy, my poor boy he was a middle aged man he used to go to the bowling club and every day and drown his sorrows in the amber liquid and his family you know so sad you know when he passed away but uh, nepotism you know only is only carried so far as, as long as you pay bo- play ball with the people in power so tim found out that his family was not so clean afterwards you know <laughs> when we used to have our bureau of stats gathering everybody in the bureau said he used to laugh at tim he used to keep boasting you know hey my family is clean hey my family is clean well poor fellow found out the hard way you know his family wasn't all that clean afterwards okay now yeah. moving on your work was not only limited to just wages and workers rights etc um i've done some reading you also did uh, massive work on women's empowerment in fiji and the fiji women's rights movement awarded you the title of the people's professor how yes. did you get in, how did you get involved <laughs> in uh, in feminist issues uh, well it well, probably started you know from the early years you know when amelia rokotivuna was the director of ywca uh and we had a lot of feminist friends Claire Slater Arlene Griffin Vanessa Griffin you know uh and uh, of course you know later on people like uh, Shimi Mali and you know Tara Chetty and them in fact it was Tara Chetty when she was the head of FWRM with the assistance of my my close friend uh un- close and i won't say unbiased french uh, shona smiles <laughs> well, her mother and they mm-hmm. decided to give me this title of people's professor which i really really valued i mean you know uh and and uh, so, you know i mean i i did a a, a first bit of work uh, on uh, on women you know uh, gender issues in employment and underemployment and incomes in fiji for it was funded by ozaid it was launched mm-hmm. at usp with great fanfare by the previous acting vice chancellor esther williams and uh, you know I, i mean i continued that work i mean uh, i did some work for pacific women uh two years ago on the impact of covid on women in fiji uh, and and this last year i did one for another work for very solid bit of work for fiji women's rights movement called the economic empowerment of fiji women and girls uh, beyond 33% so that's ready for publication and the uh, fiji women's rights movement nalini singh and laisa bultale they're working on it and they should be launching it very very soon i hope uh, so you know that's one of the things uh, uh, in fiji which is uh, you know women have been marginalized and men have been marginalized you know as workers and all that so that was my second great big uh, area of work uh, for years which has continued over the years well done now by this stage of your life fiji had seen the 1987 coup and the yeah. 2000 coup which yes. we will discuss shortly in detail however yeah. i note that uh, between the years two 2001 and 2006 you gave lectures to RFMF officers and even right before the 2006 elections now who organized this for you yeah well you know the RMF uh, uh, military forces they they had these officer training courses at Watuhanga mm-hmm. and and every now and then i would i'd be invited by them to go and speak whenever a new batch of officers were coming through so you know they'd invite me to go and speak about you know general economic issues in the country development issues and you know i thought well like hell you know surely educating these people can't be bad for the rfmf right because you know it's only uneducated people who don't understand the consequences of what they're doing they they lead countries as say so you know at the at the rfmf think i mean i i came to know all these people you know you know on, on personal terms you know frank benimarama dritti siruratu lalambalavu 
not to George Kandavu Levu, Tikwe Tonga, Aziz, and many others who've often been in the news. And, you know, in, in, just before the 2006 elections, I was asked by Frank to do a coup for all his top 400 officers at the Nambua, you know, uh, training courses, right? Le, le, and, uh, you know, I started off my lecture, morning, a whole day lecture, by saying that the government of the day ought to follow, the, the, the RF, RFMF must respect the government of the day and follow, you know, the orders of the prime minister. Well, of course, I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes, you know, which I found out later, right? But this was like waving a red flag in front of a bull because Frank then harangued me for 15 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I couldn't understand where that was coming from, but I understood afterwards, of course, right? So, you know, you know, he, soon afterwards, you know, when uh, uh, when when uh, the 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 Labour Party, I mean, you know, uh, and 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 so that, well, not not Labour Party, but when uh, Garessis Party uh, won the elections, uh, soon after, you know, Frank uh, did the coup, and it returned uh, Garessi, but he but he he reappointed, uh, but he appointed his multi-party government, and it is forgotten, you know. That it was a multi-party government of of of, of Garase and the FLP, which was removed by by Beni Marama's 2006 coup. The only reason why, in my opinion, why that is not remembered today and it is not even reminded by the Labour Party, right, is because Man Chaudhry refused to be part of Garase's multi-party government. And people in Fiji will remember he even tried to become the leader of the opposition while his his, his FLP members were part of the cabinet. I mean, how crazy is that? Well, Bill, Bill Barrows, of course, Mick Barrows, of course, wasn't too happy about that. And, you know, he opposed it. But, uh, you know, the thing is that Man Chaudhry refused to be part of it. And publicly, I mean, it's all on record, the FLP president, Jackie Kurui, she publicly called on Beni, Beni Marama to do the coup. And soon after the coup, well, you know, no major corruption has been ever re revealed. But... Uh, Man Chaudhry joined the Minister of Finance, you know, as uh, joined the government. As let, the let, let, me just, let me just stop you there for a moment. Yeah. I think you're getting too far ahead because I just yeah. want to dissect this a bit. If we look at if, if we look at the stated purpose of the 2006 coup, as stated by Mr. Mbani Marama at that time, yeah. uh, it, it was claimed that he did it because of widespread corruption. Yes. Now you can tell us what is your take on that? Well, 16 years later, there's been no corruption proven. There's no corruption by any of Garasi's ministers, whether they were from the SDL or, or whether they were from uh, Fiji Labour Party. I mean, nobody talks about the corruption of the spirit. And to be honest, when people have seen of corruption since then, whatever happened then just pales into insignificance. And when people want to talk about Mahen Chaudhry's corruption, as, as Ayaz has done recently, oh, he spent $40,000 on his home, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Super Point. Oh, well, hell, you know, he was the prime minister, $40,000, that's peanuts, right? Mm -hmm. Other prime ministers have spent, you know, millions on their homes, whichever official home they went into. So to argue that he did his coup for corruption was absolutely baseless. And, and in fact, uh, his later arguments actually changed because of all the people who came to help him afterwards, right? But, uh, I mean, Mahen Chaudhry basically gave the message to the country, uh, this coup is okay. And then you saw, of course, Arya Samaj, Sanatan Dharam, Muslim League, all the NGOs came in to support him. Even my friends in the CCF, sadly, you know, I mean, Reverend Aquila Yambaki, you know, back the, the, the 2006 coup. And I think all because they disliked uh, the ethno-nationalism, which they saw in Garase. You know, and to me, I mean, I was horrified. That was actually the, the, also the year when I parted the company with many of my friends, because a coup is a coup is a coup. You know, and, and and you can't say a coup is okay, you know, in the if it's in the interests of Indo-Fijians, but it's not okay if it's in the interests of indigenous Fijians. So I, I parted company with uh, with a lot of my friends, you know, sadly. Uh, now, well, then, I guess not many people know this, yeah. but I am reliably informed yeah. that uh, you were also asked to join Frank Banimarama's military council. Is there any truth to this uh, information? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true. It's true. Major Howard Polatini, mm -hmm. who is apparently now a member of parliament, uh, rang me up and said Frank Benimarama was inviting me to join his cabinet. I got the shock of my life, of course. 
And I told him, look, this is an illegal coup. I've already explained and written so many articles showing how coups damaged the country, you know, so badly forever and a day. And it would cost the country dearly. And then uh, to my even bigger amazement, the most powerful businessman, you know, most, most powerful businessman in Fiji he, he, on the golf course, he said, oh, uh, what didn't buy? If you want to become Minister of Finance, I'll talk to Frank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I looked at him in amazement. I said, businessman, you're not asking me, would you like to become a minister of finance? I'll talk to Frank. Oh, dear. Anyway, I told him no. The next few years, you know, I, I, I tried four times to convince Benny Marama to return to the barracks. First of all, by myself in 2007. Then in 2008, Ratu Choni Manre Wiwi and Tupo Dronindolo, we wrote a letter begging, you know, Frank, not begging, actually, we asked him to return to the bag, explain what they could do. And I wrote another letter in 2009 together with Professor Biaman Prasad. And then I went once and actually spoke to Frank's cabinet in around 2010, I forget the exact date, you know, about how it would be better if he returned the, the country to civilian rule. But, you know, he had other ideas, of course, and we didn't really know at that time what had gone on behind the scenes. So all our, all our proposals were, were rejected. You were given the offer to join Bani Marama and you refused. Yes. You yeah. then kept writing against the Bani Marama government. Yes. You kept educating the Fijian community on all kinds of issues like what was happening to the FNPF, the massive over-expenditure on Fiji Roads Authority, the dangerous increase in public debt, etc., with no accountability. What motivated you to keep on writing in this nature? Well, the thing is, you know, as an economist, right, uh, I, I, I've had my fingers on the pulse of the country. You know, I mean, on my computer are, are these, you know, absolutely millions of data, statistics on what was happening to our public debt, our public, our deficits, our government revenues, government expenditure, everything. And you could, I could see these things all absolutely worsening. And, and, and the problem was that in the olden days when PWD, for example, let's just take this uh, infrastructure expenditure, right? PWD had a budget of uh, 40 to 80 million, 80 million max, 40 million. Whatever it did was subject to, to audit by the Auditor General's office. They went through everything, right? And any money went, went misused, they would pick it up, right? When, when Frank and them came in, especially after 2011, they set up all these public enterprises and, and gave them massive amounts of money, which because they were allegedly not government anymore, which is absolutely false, of course, the Auditor General was not allowed access to them. And so where PWD used to get 40 million, this Fiji Roads Authority, for example, for four or five years, years was given more than 500 million every year. And all kinds of international companies came in, in into Fiji, carpetbaggers, and they ripped off millions. Some of them, of course, ended up in the courts with the, with the Beni Marama government refusing to pay them, right? But by that time, it was too late. I'm sure people in Fiji will, in Suwa will remember that there's a time when, the, when that road going down to Suva Point was dug up all unnecessarily, right? And re, re and 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 re resealed with you know boys from New Zealand, white boys from New Zealand coming and sweeping the road. I mean, God knows at what expense, right? But all that money was wasted on the roads all over Fiji, and and the, and the infrastructure was built to very very poor standards. And then the result we all know: roads have been bloody, you know, breaking down all over Fiji. The water supply has been breaking up, all kinds of things, and you know. All that money, billions of dollars, I don't know, between 2011 and 2018, probably there was an over-expenditure of about $10 billion. Had it been done under the ADB, for example, they would have kept a very, very close look at it. Nothing would have been improved un unless there actually was a good economic rate of return. But for all these people's expenditure, there was no such oversight. And we have ended up with this huge public debt. So I was writing about all this public debt and all that right from the time it was starting. You know, I know Narube has been talking about it for the last three, four years when he's been a politician. But right, you know, he never refers, of course, to, to all that was said. And it's all on, on the website, of course, right? Some of it between 2011 and 14, I could not get published because of the censorship. And so, mm -hmm. you know, people like, you know, David, Professor David Ray, Roby in AUT and all that, he used to put it on his Pacific Scoop and all that. And of course, they were always on my website. People can go on my website and then just go through those years. And they're all there, including all the ones which were censored in Fiji. So, you know, to me, I was trying to write about this, of this, these problems as they started to occur. 
you know, no point in pointing it out after they had occurred, like the ADB does and the World Bank does. And the World Bank, of course, never comes and tells the public honestly what's going on. They're very, very strategic and, and political. And you've got to read between the lines, even when they tell you, tell you, you know, what's gone wrong four years late afterwards. It's too late now, you know. And sadly, mm-hmm. we, we are now in absolute pits. And I would hate to be the next government in Fiji. I'll discuss that in a while. Yeah. I will discuss that in in, in a while when we look at uh, the public debt situation. Now, you referred to your website. uh, I'll give you a plug here. That's Narsi on Fiji. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, folks, if you want to read uh, on those articles that Professor Narsi is talking about, the website is called Narsi on Fiji. And and you uh, you, you, you can search the website at the top. There's a box there. Mm-hmm. Put in any word you like there, public debt or whatever, and all articles to do with that word public debt will come up. Okay, let's now, I stopped you earlier on. You had uh, just touched on uh, USP. Let's look at the troubled times for you. Now, in 2011, your professional life faced a turbulent phase. You were forced mm-hmm. by the USP to resign. What happened? I think before I was forced to resign, I go back to a year earlier. Uh, You know, this period that I was in USP, 2007 to 2011, was one of my most productive years at at USP. And, and, you know, it actually illustrates what a fantastic university uh, uh, USP is, was in that period, right? Although it's changed quite a bit, right? But uh, by by 2010, the people in the Beni Marama government were already putting pressure on Rajesh Chandra, right? I found out afterwards. And the first thing that he tried to do with the support of his senior management team, all his deans and deputy VCs, was he tried to deny me a, a, a normal three-year contract renewal. He just gave me one-year contract renewal, claiming all kinds of, you know, bullshit reasons, really, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'll tell you something, uh, Sashi. If anybody wants to know what a good university USP was, just go and look at what it did between the period 2007 and 2011. At that time, Professor Bhiman Prasad was a dean of my faculty of business and economics. I tell you, uh, you know, he's my student as well, and I don't praise him because of that. But, you know, he was an incredible facilitator. You know, we published monographs and books and things, you know, which the, all the people in Fiji absolutely liked. We ran development dialogues around the Pacific in Samoa, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Tonga, Kiribati, where we, you know, we, we talked with the civil servants and ministers and things. People from our faculty went and gave lectures and things. Local people, lo- local governors of reserve banks gave their lectures and things, right? At USP, uh, with, uh, and I chaired a, a committee, we, we, we ran a huge half a million dollar a symposium on population and development, three-day conference uh, funded by UN, UNFPA. Out of that $500 million, we saved $200,000. It came back to the USP population program. And, you know, I tell you, in this period, you look at the panel discussions at USP, the public lectures and all that. Bhima and Prasad, you know, is, a, is an incredible facilitator. You know, and I feel sorry for, for the people of Fiji that here he is. He sacrificed his job at USP to go into parliament. He's offered for eight years now to help Beni Marama government with all kinds of things. They, they've, they've rubbished him. They've talked him down. And yet I know that, you know, were his offers to have been taken up to help in the running of, of the country, you know, Fiji would be a different place. But there's one bloke in the, in the Beni Marama government who will not countenance any other independent thinker, you know, in the management of, of the country. So they have turned him down. But I can tell you, I look at what he did at USP as the dean of the faculty. We managed to get all the academics in our faculty contributing to what we were doing, right? It was a great period. And, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, of course, you know, my friend Rajesh Chandra knew about my international publications, right? Yeah, but that didn't determine. He tried to give me a limited contract renewal. I fought it all the way to USP Council. And to my great relief and my eternal thanks to the late Iqbal Janif, he chaired the appeal, appeals committee and he decided in my favor. And he said, I was an exemplary academic. So totally exhausted, you know, by this battle. I couldn't believe what had happened to me. My own friend for 30 years was doing this to me, right? Uh, Together with the two deputy vice chancellors, one of whom also has been my friend for 30 years, right? And was with me at Otago University once. Uh, I went on my six-month sabbatical to Japan. And 
in the middle of the sabbatical, I got another great big shock. And what was that? I mean, he wrote so a letter. You in Japan? You in Japan? He wrote a letter to me. Rajesh Chandra wrote a letter to me and said, "I want you back here in Suva to un to answer allegations that you are undermining the university, and I want to see you in USP on this date or else." <laughs> so I okay. had to fly back, you know, for a meeting with Rajesh Chandra and uh, together with his two deputy VCs, Susan Kelly and Esther Williams, and and uh, Professor Biuman Prasad was one dean, two other deans. Uh, refused to attend that meeting, <laughs> and I know why one of them refused. And uh, anyway, uh, they 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 said they said to me a lot of different things, you know. But the the guts of it was the Fiji government has not, and I'm quoting to you directly, right, from the mm -hmm. meeting. And I've got okay. a verbatim record of it. I won't tell you how I've got it, but I've got a verbatim record of the entire one-hour-long meeting. The Fiji That's government really. has not paid its contribution to the end of July, $30 million. First time it has done so. The letter from the government has specifically mentioned that the Minister of Finance, who is also the PM, has refused to release the funds. But if you were to say apologize in writing to the PM and AG, we will reconsider it all. And so my that's reply in, was... Yeah. So that's what was said... Or, or, okay, and what was your reply? I, I actually replied, and that's also on the record there. If anybody wants me to play it back in court, I can do that. They are legit illegitimate treasonous prime ministers and illegitimate treasonous attorney general. I don't refer to them as prime ministers and attorney general. So the question of apologizing to them is totally out. Then he demanded that I stop writing all these critical articles in the media or resign for the good of the university, financial good of the university, and go outside and write what I like. And I saw later some correspondence that the pressure had come from Ayaz Kayum. And of course, this is the same pressure they had applied recently with the, with the VC Paul Aluwalia, but they failed because the USP Council, uh, you know, has stood firmly by, by VC Aluwalia. Uh, I, could have, I could have stayed to fight, but I had already had one huge fight. I was sick and tired of them, you know, and like a coward, you know, I resigned, you know. Well, let, let me explore with you this scenario. USP's loss could have been some other institution's gain. Could you not get work uh, at, say, another university in Fiji? Uh, well, the, all the other universities were controlled by the Fiji government, you know. And, and to be honest, you know, I, I looked at what they were doing at their universities. I mean, even, you know, even Shaista, you know, Shamim, when she was uh, got into a management position at Fiji University, asked me to apply for a job there, you know, not too long ago. And I just... It didn't have the heart to do that. I was still doing some very, very good consultancy work with the Bureau of Stats, funded by AusAid, and I was earning a reasonable income. And, and until, of course, uh, Tim Benamarama himself was kicked out, and then the Fiji Bureau of Stats stopped giving me work, and no one else did it either. I kept publishing my out views on my on my personal blog, outlets in New Zealand like Pacific Scoop and all that. Put a lot of education videos on uh, on YouTube for the two, 2014 elections, but you know all to no avail. And the whole electoral system, of course, you know, with the naive assistance of priests like David Arms, and was totally rigged. Large numbers of thousands of 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 candidates with thousands of votes could not get elected, while you know Fiji First Party candidates with a few hundred got elected and became ministers. So much for the propaganda, you know, that all votes are of equal value. Yeah. But, uh, well, I kept writing. But, you know, in the end, uh, it's all there basically on my website. You know, so if you want me to talk about some specific things, feel free to ask now, me. Now, well, at this stage, uh, let's have a look at the impact on the Fijian economy, livelihoods and poverty. Um, Fiji has had uh, a number of coups so far. Let me first get your views on the impact of all the coups on Fiji people's welfare. Okay. Uh, for all students in Fiji, I suggest mm -hmm. there's one little thing that you can do which you can get back from the World Bank uh, International website. You can get data on GDP per capita of any country in the world for the last 50, 60 years. Do that for Fiji. Do that for for Mauritius, for example, in, in US dollars per capita, whatever it is. And you will find that in 1950, not 1950, 1970, 1970, Fiji's GDP per capita was more than that of Mauritius. More. Mm -hmm. 50 years later, 
it is half that of Mauritius. So GDP per capita is, is, if you like, total income per person in the country. So can you imagine, for example, you know, ask every person in Fiji, every household in Fiji, every adult in Fiji, what would your life, life be like today if your income was magically doubled? But of course, it won't be magically doubled, even if you have good economic growth for the next three, four, five years. You know, there's a graph that I have in one of my writings, which is a fantastic one, right? Which shows the GDP per capita was rising, 87 coup took place, it fell. Then the economy recovered, it started to rise again. Then another coup happened and it fell. Then it began to rise again and then it fell. And you have a line, which is, if you like, the old line, which is going mm -hmm. steadily along there, and the actual line, which is the gap, is getting wider and wider and wider. So basically what we have done cumulatively, right, over the last 50 years is that our incomes have not grown as well as they could have because of all these schools. But what has also happened today, you know, and it's happened in the last seven, eight years, right, is that it's been accompanied by this massive growth in public debt. Oh, it is a frightening thing which ordinary people have no comprehension about because they don't know about it because it's all going to be paid for by the future generations. Today, okay, so, everything may be hunky-dory. Okay, we'll come to the public debt issue in just a moment, but you've just described the effects of the coups. Now, with that, I believe hand-in-hand hand is the issue of uh, poverty, poverty levels. Now, the last ADB report put the poverty level at 29-point-something uh, percent, so let's say 30%. What can you say about the poverty levels in Fiji? Well, well, forget about the ADB report. Uh, so she just look at the FBS because the FBS has put out a report with exactly that. In fact, the ADB is basing its uh, statement on the Bureau of Statistics data, right? Uh, you know, the right. poverty poverty rate, right, is, is done in a way by statisticians and so on. You decide what is what you call it is a basic needs poverty line. How much does a family need? right, in order to have the basics of life in terms of food, education, health, and so on, right? And then you look at the, all the people in the country through this household sample surveys, and they're very, very accurate. I tell you, Sachi, the household surveys by the Fiji Bureau of Stats are the best in the Pacific, right, and give you accurate statistics. And you find out, well, how many households are there who, 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 whose income is below that, right? And despite all the benefits of the huge remittances and all that that have come in, right? massive remittances, we can talk about that in a moment, right, which have saved Fiji really, right? Uh, in the 2019-20 household survey, 30% of people in Fiji were below the poverty line, but 40% uh, were indigenous Fijians, 40% were below, and in Indo-Fijians, 20% below. Now, in my opinion, that's an underestimate as well, because the Bureau of Stats, under the influence of the World Bank, has gone over to a new way of calculating uh, what standard you use, which is expenditure, not income, which is what mm -hmm. developed countries use. And of course, to me, and to any sensible person, hey, it's the income that decides how much you can spend, right? Not the expenditure. In Fiji, there are people who, who will save very, who will spend very little and save a lot. And there are certain mm -hmm. families, especially indigenous Fijians, whatever income they get, they spend 110% of that, right? And we know it because culturally, right? When 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 a Fijian family is doing well in Suva, you know, 10,000 people will come and camp at their home and they can't say no. Indo-Fijian mm -hmm. people, they don't have that problem. So the reality, the poverty rates in Fiji are, are worse than what appeared to be the last survey. And if you did a, 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 an actual same comparison, you'll find that it has gone really worse. Look, Sashi, don't take the statistician's words for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When talk to the people at uh, in Fiji who are at the cold face of poverty, like Sashi Kiran, you know, Nalini Singh at the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, Shamima Ali at the Women's Crisis Center, right? And all the clubs who go around giving money, you know, to the poor people and trying to get them through this terrible COVID period, right? Uh, they know what poverty is like in Fiji you know, firsthand. And and what we sort of give them are the statistics which really backs it up. But it's no substitute for the real knowledge that these people have about poverty. And under Beni Marama, well, you know, what we've got is far more than we needed to have, you know. Well, we've, we have discussed with uh, Sashi Kiran on this program as well as, well as with uh, Shamima Ali, some of the very raw data, some of the very raw statistics 
and they've shared accounts of, uh, uh, as you say, the, the ground level poverty in Fiji. Just staying on the uh, stats part of it, the Fiji Bureau of Statistics uh, differentiated the poverty level by ethnicity. Yeah. Now, I believe uh, by doing this, the statistics showed the reality of the situation on the ground. Now, you've just said that the Etho K poverty level is around about what, 36, 40 percent? Yeah, it's, it's much higher than Indo Fijians, yeah. Okay. Now, why are our Etho K brothers and sisters poorer, if I may ask that? I mean, some would say they own the land, they have resources, etc. Where does this problem arise from? Well, I mean, for a, for a start, actually, uh, look at look at them. They don't own businesses in Fiji, like shops and all that, like, you know, relatively speaking, right? Uh, they were kept out of the capitalist economy during the colonial era. So they, you know, they come, come with a handicap of not having knowledge of the business sector the way Indo-Fijians have, right? Uh, then, you know, you have the fact that their families are large. And mm -hmm. it has been, there have been larger families for, you know, three, four decades. I mean, they'll have three, four, five children. Indo-Fijian families now only have one or two children. So you're having to spread your money, your income around fewer people for Indo-Fijians and a lot more for indigenous Fijians, right? And and so, I mean, all these things, you know, plus, you know, maybe the lack of entrepreneurship and so on. There are problems about the, the, the Fijian uh, uh, native leases and so on, which I think even the Beni, Beni Marama government has tried to tackle. But, you know, you can't do it without the, the active collaboration of the people who own the land, right? But, uh, but even indigenous Fijian friends of mine over the years, if they get a chance, they invest in, 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 in uh, freehold land rather than in their own communal land. Because quite often in communal land, you know, they do not have full control. And if the chief decides, okay, you know, I would take away the use of that land from you, you've got no say on the matter. So the whole land lease situation in Fiji needs to be, to be reformed, but it can only be done with the cooperation of indigenous Fijians, not imposed on them. So there are all these reasons why indigenous Fijians, you know, are, are, are poorer. And as I say to you, you know, they, they do not save, they do not accumulate as much as Indo-Fijians, right? And, uh, you know, one thing is also happening is that, uh, you know, the, when you talk about remittances, right? When I did a last study on this thing last time, about you know, 10 years ago, and, and they, already then there were about $300 million coming from abroad to Fiji, right? And I was thinking, you know, oh, it's the indigenous Fijian soldiers, nurses, caregivers, and so on who bring the money back. I was astonished to find a large percentage coming to poorer Indo-Fijian families. And that sum has now grown to $700 million, clear money coming into Fiji with government not having to do a slightest bit to earn anything, right? You know, sugar industry brings in 150 million, but that's gross revenue, right? right? And God knows what Fiji government has to spend to get 150 million from sugar. But but the remittances have brought in $700 million. And a lot of it is coming from Indo-Fijian parents, families in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, who are sending money home to help their poorer relatives in Fiji. That has been the saving grace for Fiji. Not Fiji government, you know. And, uh, you know, well, I tell you what, those remittances will keep growing because, you know, our people keep emigrating and they're going to keep on sending money back home for a while, for a while until, you know, their own obligations in Australia, New Zealand, Canada grow so big that they can't afford to send money back, right? But up to now, they're still sending it. So, you know, the Fiji people economy has been saved because of, because of all that. Okay, now staying with our discussion on the poverty level, yeah. Would you say that this is the cumulative economic <clears throat> impact of all the coups since 1987? I mean, what can you attribute to the Bani Marama government? I mean, we, Fiji was supposed to having the um, Bani Marama boom, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's no boom here. The poverty there's levels no speak for itself. There's no boom because, you know, they, they, they basically have misspent this massive amount of infrastructure which hasn't led to sustainable growth. I mean, if you ask yourself, you know, the public debt has, has increased from about 40% of GDP to almost 90% of GDP or more than that because we can't really trust the figures coming out uh, from the Fiji government, right? Uh, what do you have to show for it? There are no new income, no, no new industries in Fiji. The tourism industry has, owes nothing to the Beni Marama government. In fact, they were they have succeeded despite the Beni Marama government, right? Uh, uh, the sugar industry under them has collapsed totally, and and they haven't. They had, well, sugar output under Garese was twice what it has been under under Beni Marama. They they borrowed this large amount of money from Exim Bank, 
and and squandered it you know uh, oh terribly squandered it you know uh, and 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 then they've got all these people they hired as expatriates to head all these public enterprises right around fiji paying them massive massive salaries giving them tons of of, of taxpayers money and what is the result you know we still don't have good economic growth and the figures show even before covid hit economic growth in fiji was slowing down so you know people like biman prasad and savin arube and them you know they, they they've got a lot of constructive ideas about what to do just as we economists have advised for a long long time but in, in but the biggest thing actually is managing the economy and one person cannot manage 12 economies 12 mm-hmm. ministries he might appear to be managing six industries six ministries and the prime minister has got six ministries but we all know in fact the one person actually is managing all those 12 ministries he can't do that he's not a superman and in actual fact he's just an accountant and a lawyer you know and 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 if you look at all his utterances over the years he's a big yame yame you know uh, person right but there's no substance behind that he's a showman and i tell you what i will come to it later i think there are people behind the scenes who, who are quite happy to have him you know parading around in the public eye because they don't have to do anything but in the process he is pretty well bankrupted fiji all right now in the interest of fairness uh, let me tell our viewers on sstp that uh, my invitation to the uh, minister for economy the attorney general still stands i have not heard any response i've also extended uh, an invitation to the prime minister's office and uh, i'm waiting for a reply from there as well Now what then for more than 7 odd years your Fiji time articles have been warning about the massive increase in public debt now as i say blind freddy would have taken heed of your warnings <laughs> however can you first explain to the viewer what is it about the public debt that is so potentially harmful for future generations i i believe this is a very important uh, explanation that you could give to the people of uh, Fiji. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's let us let us take a, a normal family in Fiji. Mhm. Right? Let's call him, you know, Joe Turanga, right? He has a certain income and a certain expenditure. He wants to do something, you know, in his house or his small business or whatever, so he goes and borrows money from a bank. Right? That loan must be repaid every year maybe for 10 years. Now that loan must be repaid which includes a principal element and an interest element right that's how the banks calculate it right and that must be paid every year out of his revenue and then what is left after that payment of the bank loan is then available to fund his consumption his education of his children health expenses and so on but the public debt charges must be paid first and if he wants to spend more he's got to borrow more and increase his public debt more so the country is exactly like that you know fiji is a country right it has got a government budget it's got a revenue coming in and it's got an expenditure so if you look at the budget documents every year right on the first page of the budget documents you'll see charges on public debt which is the principal and interest payments and they must come out first before the country can spend on education on health on infrastructure roads water now if the public debt becomes too big right the public debt becomes too big then he has got to spe- the government has to squeeze the expenditure you got to spend less on education on health and all that you know most countries they borrow i mean australia has been borrowing money for 100 years but they spend money on wisely the gdp per capita the incomes of the country have been growing in proportion and when the economy grows government revenue goes in proportion so governments over here are able to pay for the public debt and whatever they need they need on an increasing level in fiji what we have done in the last 7 years they have spent a huge amount of money all on borrowed money which this government is not having to pay for now this government will depart after the next election then they will fly away to the to the safety zones who will pay for it and this is the the strangest part of public debt sashi you know how on earth how on earth can you as an individual borrow from the bank and tell the bank oh don't worry mate if i can't pay the public debt my children will pay for it 
Mm. It's fine. Yeah, it usually happens. But this is different. When a government says, oh, I'm going to borrow from ADB, World Bank, from China, from everywhere and all that, from FNPF and all that. But if we can't pay it, ah, the future generation, everybody else, will pay for it next year, the year after that, the year after that. I mean, it's an incredibly sacred power that governments have to borrow on behalf of taxpayers who must pay it. Not them. Not today's taxpayers. Future taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And if they can't pay it, right, at some point in time, they've got to borrow more. So you see, I can see in today's, yesterday's newspaper, you know, AIS is planning to borrow one more billion dollars from outside sources. Well, the trouble with borrowing from foreign sources, Sashi, is this. You borrow locally from FNPF, and you might borrow too much from them. You can always pay them in Fiji dollars. If necessary, the government can print money and pay FNPF in Fiji dollars. Of course, that would create inflation, and everybody's savings and money would devalue in money, right? But when you borrow from ADB, from World Bank, from commercial banks or overseas like ANZ or anything, they don't want pieces of Fijian paper. They want foreign exchange. And if you don't have foreign exchange, tough luck. Your credit rating will go down. You, you'll have to devalue your currency. It'll be an absolutely disastrous thing for everybody's cost of living because all of us you know, live, depend on imported goods and services for our living expenses and things, living standards and all that. And if you go too far, you'll become like Greece and Portugal. Portugal, you know, the, the entire economy is collapsed because they couldn't repay their public debt. So public debt is a, is a is a time bomb. You've got to manage it. And there are some countries in the world, uh, uh, Sashi, where the Reserve Bank you know, uh, is given powers to say that public debt must not exceed this proportion of GDP. It must not exceed that. And they, they force governments to, to live within their means. But this government has refused to live within its means. It's kept on spending wildly. Right, it, it refused to even when COVID hit. There were people in the tourism industry being sent home by the employers. Right, zero incomes. This country, right, they refused to actually have a job keeper allowance like Australia or job seeker allowance. Right, they they refused to cut anybody's incomes, including you know of course you look at the, the prime minister's salary. You know the guy said no military officer will benefit from this coup. Well, my goodness, you know he increased his salary from below hundred thousand to above three hundred thousand. Right. He gives himself a per diem in excess of, you know, two two and a half thousand dollars a day. No Australian or New Zealand prime minister has ever got this kind of uh, of expenses ever in the history. And, you know, we've got a very, very greedy set of people who actually have, have feathered their own nest and at the expense of taxpayers. So the public debt is a very sacred thing. Governments should not misuse it. And this government has misused it terribly. Well, then, well then um, let me just... Flip the coin. Mm. There will be certain Fiji First uh, supporters mm. who will say that uh, don't all governments borrow and spend on infrastructure like roads and water? And is that not what the Fiji First government has done? And particularly the um, the, the mention of uh, loans with such low interest rates, uh, where it has been suggested that when the time comes to pay. It, it, uh, they'll virtually be paying just the loan amount. Um, what do you say to that? You know, I t okay, I tell you what. I mean, don't take my word for it, right? But organizations like the ADB, when they give loans to Fiji, you know, they've got economists who have very tight control over how this money is spent. For a start, they will not give money on any project which has not been properly costed and economic cost, you know, rate of return calculated, right? So all investments, you know, in Australia and New Zealand and all that, they might have cost overruns like every other place in the world. But whatever they invest in, there has an economic rate of return which makes the GDP grow so that the debt can be repaid. Sadly, Fiji doesn't fall into that category. There was no, no analysis done of many of these projects. And a certain person just got carried away with his power as Minister of Economy and just rubber stamped all these expenditures. People came and they went. You know, PWD used to be, of course, staffed by locals once upon a time, local managers of, of water, of roads and all that. In the last 10 years, all these expatriates have come in, shared it, earned huge salaries and disappeared over the horizon. And the Auditor General reports, which could have actually exposed these things, was not released from 2006 until 2014. Right? And they were all landed on the, on, on, on the public, you know, in one year, you know. And, and not only that, 
they they failed to to audit all these public enterprises which had been set up to replace government departments so so sadly i mean you know you can't compare fiji's public debt you know expenditure with those of good countries like australia or new zealand you mentioned a few minutes ago that fiji is now in a in a hole a big hole and that yeah. you do not envy the next government that yes. is uh, to me that is indeed a huge dilemma let yes. me ask you this what can be done to address this debt situation i mean how does any incoming government get out of this quagmire out of this hole well you know you said earlier that there are some countries who will forgive this debt or they charge very low interest rates yes well, that's fine but this you know but you know that's limited and you can actually do i mean the ministry of finance you know has got uh, uh, spreadsheets which i asked them for once because i did my own independent analysis and they refused to give me the spreadsheet of of how the debt repayment schedule will go over the next 10 15 20 years right so they do have that and essentially it all will depend on having very healthy rates of growth in the economy right whereby we can cut back on unnecessary expenditure while repaying off large bits of this foreign debt right and the only way you can have this very very healthy rate of growth in the economy is to have good managers in the economy and these people have just shown that they don't have good managers now i tell you what if you ever had a uh, maybe you can talk about it towards the end about what a good government could look like you know in fiji at this point in time but essentially you know you you have to grow the economy have new industries you've got to exercise budgetary constraint you know on 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 areas and and to be honest uh, saji you know people will have to pay the debt they have to suffer to repay this debt because the people who have created the debt they've created such massive amounts it's not going to be easy to repay it. and you're going to need all the cooperation between different political parties in fiji over the next 10 years to make sure that the country is run on an even and honest scale that there's complete you know accountability there's total auditing of what goes on and all the carpet baggers who are around in fiji are kicked out you know that's what they have to do it's a tough tough ask uh, sashi and 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 i don't envy i don't envy the the people who are going to come and do all this Wow. Um have a break uh, when we come back we'll discuss the impact of the Mbani Marama government on the FNPF. On Sashi Singh's Talking Point live on Facebook this afternoon, our chief guest is Professor Wadan Narsi, leading economist and a prolific writer. Please share the link on your own timeline so that you may include your family and friends in this broadcast. A full recording of this broadcast can also be viewed later on facebook and on youtube as well now as i said uh, we'll discuss the impact of the mbani marama government on the fnpf wadan um you say in your writings that the fnpf is the largest financial institution in fiji more than all the banks put together but the mbani marama government has totally gutted it now this is a damning statement by any stretch of the imagination How has the Mbani Marama government gutted an FNPF? Pray do tell. Well, okay, let me start with with the core decision making in FNPF, uh, Sashi, right? And I'll take it in order of that because you know, after the next election, uh, this all needs to change. Right? So so FNPF board once upon a time used to have employee representatives usually coming from the unions like James Raman, Felix Anthony and others, right? They were employer representatives, right? uh to make sure that the money was used wisely as well and to advise the board and they were neutral people who usually chaired the FNPF board right and and so decisions that were made by the by the FNPF board you know by and large made sure that they followed this tight balancing act right but 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 let's remember employers contributions are called employers contribution but employers don't own that contribution it's all goes to the employees on whose behalf the contributions are coming it's coming out of the salaries bill of the employer so if you look at fnpf assets at you know and, and look at the internal account all that money belongs to employees past present and future right so so how would it happen if uh, especially you own a company you're the owner and when the when the board is set up i say to you hey mate you are the owners you and your brothers right but you're not going to sit on the board I am going to decide as the government of the day I'm going to decide who sits on that board and I of course then pick all my mates not necessarily anybody at all who will look after your interests right 
So that's what's happened in FNPF. You know, there are people who have been appointed, and some, I believe, actually have got conflicts of interest. But, you know, all the union representatives, workers' representatives have been, re been removed so that when things began to happen to the FNPF, as in 2011, there was nobody on the board to fight for workers whose money it, it all is. And, and even, the, even the FNPF management got carried away. You know, they got carried away and started to talk as if, you know, they were the ones who are the bloody owners and managers of this money, you know, and not, not, not the workers. So that's the first big one, right? So I'm going to come to the second great big theft in Fiji, right? The first theft I, I will talk about later because it's got legal implications, right? The second big theft, which started at the, at the beginning of COVID, Mm -hmm. Ayaz Kayum, as Minister of the Economy, he made the unilateral decision without talking to any unions or anything. And, and he said, uh, to help the employers along, I'm going to halve all the contributions. So he halved the employer contributions, he halved the employee contributions. But I mean, the net effect of it, of course, is that the, the, the employees, superannuation fund, the retirement funds, over a period of two years, because this is still in place now, right? It's, going to, it's been going on now for almost two years. By the end of this year, the employees will have lost almost $300 million of their money, their retirement funds, right? Can you say Half that of, again, please? Can you repeat that? Okay, okay. Because they have reduced the employer contributions, right, to the FNPF, halved it, employees will have lost from their retirement funds about $300 million and half of it, $150 million, will have gone straight back into the pockets of the employers. And I say half because the other half would have gone to government as an employer, roughly. Because the government is an employer as well. Remember that? Yeah. But, but essentially, a free gift of $150 million, the stroke of a pen. Now, no country in the world, not even Australia, not even them reduced the FNPF contributions. Not even them. Because that's a very sacred thing that has been fought for for years in Australia, started by Prime Minister Paul Keating. I mean, you know, he's revered in Australia for whatever he did as a Labour means Labour Prime Minister, but he's revered by everybody because he started that superannuation scheme and he has fought, you know, bitterly for it even after he retired as Prime Minister. In, in Fiji, Ayaz did that. Now, the sad thing, of course, especially for workers, is they don't see it immediately because, you know, as far as the income is concerned at the moment, those who are employed at the moment, the income is coming in. And it might even appear to go up a little because they're not having to put it into FNPF, right? So artificially, they think they're okay. But the reality is $300 million will have disappeared from the FNPF accounts. And if you work out how much this $300 million would have amounted to in 20 years' time, they have lost by compound interest of 5%, which is what FNPF earns, they would have lost almost $2 billion from their superannuation fund. And wow. my God, you know, it, it's all happening behind the scenes and workers don't understand it, right? So, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't blame unionists like, you know, Felix Anthony and others for, for, for actually fighting for it, but not being able to take an aggressive line because of the huge censorship that's on them and the intimidation. Police have been taking them in for questioning and all that. I mean, jeepers, the police have got a lot to answer for. How dare they? And, you know, the, the, the ironical thing about this, Sashi, is this. Losing all this FNPF money hurts not only ordinary workers in their country, it also hurts every policeman. It hurts every military rank and file soldier. It helps, mm -hmm. it hurts the, the military officers. It hurts everybody. And so, and so you know, uh, to me, I mean, you know, one has to wonder, you know, the trouble is because it's all happening quietly, it'll happen in the future. The ordinary people can't understand it. But the intelligent people in Fiji, the Accountants Congress, the Lawyers Society, the Lawyers, they, all the intelligent people should be up in arms about what, what, what AIS has done over here. And that, to me, is the great big robbery. Okay, let me go on to the other robberies, which happens quietly behind the scene. People will know, and this happened under other governments as well, right? Under Alliance government, under uh, not so much Alliance government, Rambuka government, under 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 Garase government. Whenever Fiji went through a crisis of foreign exchange, right, coups and all that, the Reserve Bank told FNPF, you must bring back your foreign investments from overseas. Now, why do we have foreign investments overseas? Because quite often FNPF doesn't have enough money to invest within Fiji. So they invest it overseas where the returns are higher. 
when you force FNPF to bring it back to Fiji, the Reserve Bank gives them little pieces of paper called Fijian dollars, which sits mm -hmm. in their account. Where do they invest it? Well, first of all, government is there to borrow from them. So they have got a captive market. Or they actually try and invest it in Fiji. Sometimes it's very, very bad investments. Sometimes, like, for example, they've been forced to lend to FSC, a bankrupt company, for 10 years, right? Will they ever get their money back? I don't know. They've been forced to lend to, to, to Air, Fiji Airways. Will they get their money back? I don't know, mate. And, and basically, whatever they earn from the money they have brought back to Fiji is less income from it in Fiji than they would have got overseas. So that income actually goes to the Reserve Bank of Fiji, effectively, because they invest it wherever it's best for them, right? And where does their profit go to? It goes to the government of Fiji. So everybody wins out from this, except the workers who own the FNPF money. So that wow. is a big thing, right? Yeah. Well, and there's a third the... one, small one, maybe it's, it's you know maybe in terms of dollar terms, but it has huge legal implications, which I'll talk about now. Yeah. It is it it is absolutely mind-boggling that uh, I mean, I love the way you've described. It's not employers' contribution. The reality is, it's the employees' contribution, yes. and yes. and and the the decrease of that that contribution. $300 million is just mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. And if compounded, as you said, uh, wow, it is absolutely staggering. Now, still on the FNPF, you've said in your many articles that the Mbani Marama government has struck, the, uh, struck at the heart of uh, rule of law in Fiji by military decrees. It passed in 2012, for instance, which halved the pensions of existing pensioners and stopped the legal case from being heard. There was a legal case, I, I understand. Yeah, it was, it's called the, well, I've called it in my writings, I've called it the David Burness uh, Shamim legal case, right? Because Shaista Shamim, a long friend of mine for 30 years, right? <laughs> the Shamim sisters were all friends of mine, including Nazat Shamim, right? Uh, she took on this David Burness's case pro bono, which means she didn't charge a fee, right? And I helped her draw up the whole case for it, you know, economically and financially, all that, even while I was in Japan, you know, during my sabbatical, right? I did a lot of work on it. And uh, Shaisa, to her credit, you know, they took it to, she took it to court. It was being heard by Justice Hetriaki, Hetriaki, I think a Sri Lankan judge, right? But in the middle of the case, uh, the government passed a decree signed by Ratu Ipeli Nelitikau as, as president, right? which stopped it from being heard. And, and you know, there were thousands of pensioners, you know, and me included, I declare my interest in it, right? Uh, and I wasn't getting fantastically huge amounts from it, but there were others who were getting a bigger amount. But, uh, but uh, uh, stopped the case from being heard. And, uh, and the terrible thing is that the 2013 document which, has, which came in after the Yashgai constitution was, was, was threshed, also has got a clause in there which says that uh, no legal cases which were stopped by the military government may be heard from now on. So which means mm -hmm. that when you talk about it, you see, the, see this was a contract between pensioners. You know, when, when, you, when you reach 55, you, the, the FNPF gives you a piece of paper. Here you sign it, mate. Uh, you choose either the lump sum, which you'll get now, or you choose a pension at this rate, you know, 15%, 16% or whatever it is for the rest of your life until you die. And if you live beyond, let's say, about uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 years, well, you've got most of your money back. But if you die within four years, tough luck. Mm. You've lost your money forever. And there were lots of people in the FNPF management have never, ever talked about the many, many hundreds of pensioners who, because of the declining life expectancy in Fiji, who, who died before they could use up their pension money. But, you know, the, but that was that was a terrible thing because there was a contract signed by FNPF, offered by FNPF, signed by the FNPF pensioner. And, and on that is are, are phrases which says that once you've signed it, you can't change it. You can't go back on it. So even the foreign consultants who the FNPF hired during this period, in particular a woman named Shona Tompkins, right? Uh, she she wrote there and says, I will not deal with this reduction of existing pensions because that is outside of the rule of law. Something like that. Those reports have never been made public by the FNPF, right? But anyway, they pushed it through 
And, you know, sadly to me, actually, Shasta Shamim also, you know, in 2006 coup took place, you know, she also justified the commission, although she was a Fiji human rights uh, commissioner, she justified the coup. Uh, and then she just went away quietly and she's now the vice chancellor at Uni Fiji, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, to me, that 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 case, you know, is still there. And it, it strikes at the heart of law and order everywhere in the world. Anybody in the world must be able to go to court with their just grievance, whether it's loss of property, as in this case, or loss of human human life or whatever. Well, then it is just mind-boggling as to how events in Fiji have shaped up in the period after 2006. Now, the question that immediately comes to mind is, um, how has Fiji come to all of this? I mean, what do you attribute the total deterioration of Fiji to what we see today? Yeah, well, two sets of factors, uh, Sashi. I mean, uh, honestly, uh, one is uh, the senior military officers' coup culture since 1987, right? That's Mm -hmm. one. And the second one is after 2006 especially, right? There's a there's an active collaboration of civilians, and these are good people. They're good people. I mean, in my in my book, right? And I'll talk a little bit about them, right? Who, in 2006, came and and supported the military government and everything else that they did after that, right? In the in the firm in the in the, in the great belief that they were doing good for Fiji. So I mean, I, I can take them in order, Sashi, because it, this is yes. a horribly all right. difficult, complex uh, situation. Eh? Okay, so let's let's uh, look at the first issue raised by you. What yeah. do you mean when you attribute Fiji's total deterioration yes. to the military officers' prisoners' coup culture? What do you yes. mean by that? Well, uh, I, I I actually, you know, one of you, one of your guests on your program, uh, Sashi, was uh, Graham Davis, right? Yes. And and his his grub sheet in the last. Uh, you know, a couple of years has gone steadily uh, more and more uh, and ex- in explaining what is wrong with Fiji. And I think, you know, everybody should actually read his his, his grub sheet uh, Facebook because he says a lot of good things and he reveals a lot because he was on the inside, you know, with Benny Marama and Kayum. But there's one thing which he said, you know, in his program, uh, which I, I actually quite disagree with, which is that he said the RFMF, you know, uh, 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 they're, they're all honorable men and women. Now, you know, you know my, my inside sources, right, the military people I have worked with over the years, since 2000, they actually tell me it is completely the, the other, otherwise, you know. And, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, everybody focuses on Rambuka because he obviously did the 87 coup, right? But to me, it is wrong to focus on him, right? Because I tell you what, first coup, had this coup failed, Rambuka would have been shot for treason. Mm-hmm. And I'm quite sure. He, he actually, he's actually talked about it. You know, and he knew it. But the question is, why would the third in command in the military do the coup? Well, who was the first in command? The first in command was Ratu Ipeli Nele Tekau, one of the, the, the Bowen chiefs, right? And uh, 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 his father-in-law was the, the prime minister, right? Uh, president at the time, sorry. President mm-hmm. at the time, right? And, and, and old army people, the people, you know, who have been advising me, my friends, have told me that, you know, the strange thing was that before this 87 coup, a whole lot of very good professional soldiers were sent overseas to serve in the Middle East. In Lebanon, where people like Matereti Sarasau, Major Matetini, Major Meli Saumbulini Nayao, Major Bolo Itamana, Kadi Solomone, uh, Captain Stevita Bukarau, Manu Levu, Jackson Evans, Momoe Valu, Servakula, Semba Day. In Sinai, and I'm reading here because this is, I, I, you know, this, this is doing justice to a lot of people, right? Major Jerry Wanganisau, Captain Ada Songo Songo, Major Waningolo, Captain Sam Pickering, Lieutenant Patrick Powell, Lieutenant Patrick Hennings, right? And 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 the good officers in the military believe that had they been all in, in Fiji, right, maybe the, the coup might not have, have occurred, right? So So the most telling thing to me is that just before the coup, the commander himself knew that, that meetings were taking place, you know, planning the coup, including one in Rewanga, Rewanga where, where Ratumara's son, Finau Mara, attended together with Inoke Kumbumbola and, you know, all, all the other guys, right? Uh, uh, he went off to Perth to receive a naval boat. Mm-hmm. The coup is about to happen. Why would you leave the country, you know, and you know that the coups are being planned and plotted and, well, I think, you know, any idiot in Fiji can can understand 
why a commander would what would prefer to be out of the country because it was a trick played later by somebody else as well right mm -hmm. and 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 the thing is you know the the, the well, look let's just go by the facts right even though he was a commander he did not oppose the 87 coup but he soon received many benefits right uh, he you know he 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 was a, a, Appointed to the diplomatic service after the 2006 coup, he became a minister in the interim government of Garase. After the 2006 coup, he became a vice president and then president. He rubbished the Yash Gai draft constitution on spurious grounds and himself signed the 213 Kayum constitution. I won't say into law, but he signed it. Right? And as Speaker of the Parliament, he's been muzzling and controlling the opposition, you know, for, for, for how many years now, right? And I would suggest to listeners in Fiji, right, and this is my honest opinion, right, that everyone Fiji sees, uh, uh, everyone in public sees Fiji as a two-man show, right, and they think, oh, one is the ventriloquist and one is a puppet and all that. But, you know, I don't think that's a happy, that is a correct characterization. There, there are, are people behind the scenes, and in particular, there's a one-man person who is behind the show who has been in control all along, even though he hasn't become prime minister. All that one stage in 2000, there was talk about him becoming prime minister. But, you know, he and his family, his brother was involved there in the 2000 coup and all that. And, you know, there are military officers, uh, Sashi, who are happy to let Mr. Showman perform. Mm -hmm. Let him dance around, speak every day to the public. Let him manage or mismanage the ministries as long as their biscuits keep coming onto their bowl, as long as they keep feeding, right? So, you know, it's not a two-man show in, by any means. I actually think you have to say it's a three-man show. And, 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 and because there are people uh, uh, who, in the military hierarchy, right, who, who have not been honorable men and they have supported military coups. And to me, it's all exemplified if you analyze what happened in 2000. All right. Well, speaking of which, uh, the 2000 coup, you've said that it has been wrongly called the spade coup, yeah. and that historical accounts are quite misleading because they do not bring out the truth of Mbani Marama's role in that 2000 coup. Yeah. May I ask you, what was Mbani Marama's role in the 2000 coup? Okay, um, um, Sashi, what I'm going to say to you, right, is not just based on personal opinion, right? It's based on <coughs> reading of the Evans Board of Inquiry report, which was the only inquiry ever done into the 2000 coup. And it's been available on the website Truth for Fiji for, for quite a long time now, right? So I go by that. I also go by what Ratu Tevita Mara, Major Tevita Mara, has himself written publicly about what took place in the coup. Now, even though Tevita Mara was a, he's the son of Ratu Mara, right? Even though he supported the coup at the beginning, he and Peter Driti, but later they realized it was all going wrong and they tried to actually take take it differently and they had to run for their lives. He ran to, to Tonga, of course, because he's related to the Tongan family where he still is. And, uh, and Driti, poor fellow, he w was imprisoned, right? And I also go by a lot by what a few very, very top military officers have told me over the years, because these are contracts I know because I taught at the military courses between 2000 and 2006, and I've been in communication with them. And when I have put things on my blog, you know, especially in my submission to the Yes, yes Guide Draft con uh, con uh, uh, Commission, right, they have written to me to correct me on what I what I have written, right? And, and so... First thing I'm going to do is that, right, uh, I, uh, whatever I've written on my blog site, you know, in the early years, right, on the Yash Gai Commission has to be corrected by the fact that all of the military hierarchy did not support the 2000 coup. There were many law-abiding senior RFM officers whose reputations must not be tarnished by what I say. And I shall say their names, uh, uh, Sashi, because it's important, you know, that they should not be dishonored, right? There's George Kandavulevu. There was Elisa Kadi Solomone. There was Aquila Buondromo. There was Meli Saumbuluni Yao. There was Orisi Rambuka Wanga, William Serebukola, Sam Wanga Vakatonga, Wanganisau, Sam Saumatua. 
Mm-hmm. There were also a number of decent officers who resigned after the 2006 coup because they felt very deeply that the RFM integrity had been in compromise. There was Sam Pickering, there was John Pickering, Kepa Bon Romo, Patrick Hennings, Madhu Manulevu, Sosi Senimbulu, Neuri Tandulala. And you know, you know. Uh, so these are these are people actually who are out there who just resigned. And they, why why did they why don't they come up and talk about you know what they felt was wrong? Well, Saji, you know, I have often grappled with that, this thing called the culture of silence. You know, with Rati mm-hmm. Chodi, Bandra, Vivi, and I have discussed quite often, right? And the trouble is, you know, there's two things. Fiji is a small place. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody is related to everybody. And, and and there's a Fijian culture, you know, where, where you don't openly criticize people. You know, you, you have a kundru nevanua, you know, it goes on around the grog bowls of Fiji, right? The murmur of the land. Uh, and and the thing is that it's not doesn't come out openly in writing, so that historians can li- write about it. Historians, you know, all the all of them, they just talk about what comes out in written form, not what about really happens, you know, in the back. But you know, the thing is that Ratu Tevita Mara, uh, uh, you know. On that Truth for Fiji website, and Ratu Tevedamara was initially involved with that website, he says, you know, uh, he's going to reveal the truth, and he did, you know, about the illegal Fiji junta and the Beni Marama's true reasons for the 2006 coup, how he manipulated the Fiji military to cover his tracks. He says, Beni Marama did not save Fiji in 2000. He was part of the 2000 coup, and good, loyal Fiji soldiers and people suffered, and some also died because of it. Mm-hmm. This, this is This is... This is deadly stuff. This is terrible stuff. And this is what he has written, right? So it's not not my personal opinion. So, you know, after that, I went through. I went through that 1,000 pages, Sashi, of that Evans Board of Inquiry report. I mean, you know, you, I think I, you know, you, you see, anybody can see it, right? And go through it. There's a lot of, a lot of rubbish in there. But, you know, the, those three officers, four officers who did that inquiry, they junior people, and they did a bloody brave job. You know, they, you know, the, I, I must mention their names, right? Because you know, they, they, they were actually uh, uh, fairly, relatively junior to all the senior people. There was Lieutenant Colonel Evans; he's now retired. Major Gudake, and that's interesting, eh? Major Gudake resigned and is with UN. There's Warrant Officer Makamba and Major Aziz. Major Aziz, who has steadily climbed in the army, senior to everybody. Brigadier now, but never been considered for command. And that tells you something about everybody being equal in Beni Marama's Fiji, right? And he's now professor of law at the university of at Fiji University. I shudder to think what he's teaching the students, right? But but you know, when you read through it, right, the Evans Board of Inquiry report reveals very clearly in the evidence of, in particular, in the evidence of, of Serivakula. Right, who actually was very centrally involved in 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 bringing control back to back to the to on the in the coup in, uh, on the RFMF and all that, right? And he was being undermined all the time by people above him, right? So so what it's there in the Evans Board of Inquiry report is that the Army Intelligence, of which uh, Servukola was head, told uh, Beni Marama six months before the coup about meetings between his own military officers, some of them civilians. Some politicians, failed politicians, and the exact houses those meetings were being held in, involving some high chiefs from Bau, right? Beni Marama did nothing. I mean, you're a commander. You're being told there are meetings going on to discuss him having a coup, right? Six months before, and you do nothing. And then one week he was told, sir, the coup is going to happen on this day. What did he do? He went off to Norway for a meeting, and he told his officer, okay, well, you talk to other officers how to handle it. This is in the Evans report. This is in the Evans report. Yep. Okay. This is in the Evans report, right? And and so he went off to an unimportant meeting, exactly the topic uh, tactic used by Commander Nelly Tikau in 1987 when he went off to collect a boat from from Perth, right? Your, your country is going to go have a coup, and you leave the country. You are the commander supposed to be responsible for the defense and security of Fiji. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, oh. Well, they of course. They, they, there's all kinds of things. And the Evans Board of Inquiry report, it addresses it in the first few pages, right? It says, <clears throat> one, the commander refused to be interviewed by us. Oh. He's the only 
senior RFM officer who refused to be to be interviewed. And I was told by another senior man who he told them that if they if they tried to force him, they would be all discharged for uh, something. Is the medical? There's a military term that he used, and I, I'll find it here somewhere, right? But the Evans Board of Inquiry report said that the that the CRW soldiers who did the coup believed that the high command in the RFMF was supporting the coup. And they gave all the reasons, right? First, you know, uh, it was being led by Lingeri, right? right? He's the guy who actually, you know, is a powerful man, huge status in the military, and he had been brought out of retirement. Who by? Beni Marama, right? First, second, the arms for the coup were stored in the parliamentary offices of the Fijian Association Party. Well, there's some big names in there, all linked to Nele Tikau and others as well, the Kambaos and all that, right? And the arms and ammunitions from the RF, RFMF armory, even after the hostages were taken in parliament, they kept going into parliament. Their food was being supplied. Their salary was maintained. And somebody actually from the RFMF headquarters took the forms to parliamentary complex and got them to sign so that their salaries could continue. And Lingeri kept walking in and out of RFMF headquarters. And worse still, there were some senior RFMF officers who kept visiting them in parliament and offering them support. So the Evans Board of Inquiry actually uh, uh, said, uh, you know, they, they named a few, <coughs> a few people, you know, who, who, who they thought were involved, including this person, Tarakini Kini, who the Fiji public will remember coming up on TV all the time. But, you know, he was in, in phone contact. He was actually in contact with the, the CRW soldiers in the morning of the coup. And since then, you know, of course, I found out uh, that uh, the military officers, you know, they actually managed to get hold of Vodafone phone records. And, and, and they have got a whole list of people who were in phone contact in the early morning of the day of the coup. And some of those names are very, very revealing, right? But, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing is, you know, that Beni Marama was the only, only person who refused to be interviewed. And the people who were who were planning, you know, the, in the meeting in their meetings uh, before the coup and in phone conversations, according to the phone records, right? Their names are actually terrible to to hear, you know, especially for me because you know I'm friends with many of them, right? There's Nevala Rua, Tuatoka, Randuva, Epinisa, and Litia Dekumbo, Donin Dalo, Inoke Kumbumbola, Rambuka, Vakalalambure, Vili Volvola, Garinivalu, Andi Litia Dekumbo, Andi Talakuli Dekumbo. Man, you've got the whole Fijian establishment there. Just just yeah. one clarification. These names that you've taken, this is also yes. in the Evans Board of Inquiry. Oh, those, are not, those are not in the Evans Board of Inquiry. They have been actually told me, you know, by my sources, you know, in the military, who when mm -hmm. they tried to find out actually who was behind the coup, one of the, one of the key ones managed to get hold of Vodafone records, which he still has. Okay. Still has them, you know. Yeah, not oh, my right. words. So, actually. Yeah. So, how is it then that the public saw that uh, Bani Marama arresting all the Spade Group and the CRW soldiers, who yeah. were all eventually jailed, including <clears throat> some high chiefs like Ratu Chope Seniloli, yeah. uh, yeah. and some other very prominent names were spared? How how did that happen? Well, I think this is something that the indigenous Fijians, the, the, the leading people in Fiji, you know, they all know what happened, right? Uh, because there were two coups happening within, within the big coup. George Spate was only the front person, right? There was somebody else who was supposed to go and take over, you know, after the coup, and then he chickened out, you know, and the names that have been suggested are very obvious, I mean, from what I've said previously, okay, right? Let's not but mention the, those names if we can. No, we won't mention the names, no, no. But yeah. there was there were there were two other coups. The first big coup that was happening was in Fiji, there's always been tension between the three dynasties of Mara, Ganilao, and the Dakambaos. Right, mm -hmm. always. And if you look at Ratu Mara, you know, uh, one of the things he did, what was royal families in in Europe used to do, they used to marry off their sons and daughters to rivals in order to diffuse the tension. So mm -hmm. if you look at Ratu Mara's daughters, I mean, they're married to the other two chiefly dynasties, right? And 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 one of the things that happened during the 2000 coup, chiefs from Vitilevu felt, hey, it's time actually, you know, uh, the power came back to our hands. And what they did also successfully in that coup was they got rid of Ratu Mara as president to his massive disappointment, right? And the second thing that happened during the second coup that happened, some military officers saw an opportunity to actually take over the RFMF. And the group, Spade Group, 
announced at one stage that the new commander would be uh, 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 Colonel Vatu and his chief of staff would be Tare Tarakini Kini. And I think the public knows in Fiji that Beni Marama fell out very badly with Tarakini Kini afterwards. And he went off to New York and all that, right? And he, in fact, even, even threatened to sue Beni Marama and demanded, publicize that Evans Board of Inquiry report and or I'll come through the courts and get it from you, right? But anyway, you know, it was then that Beni Marama suddenly really, this is the, you know, this is what I'm being told that, uh, uh, hold on, I'm dispensable in this coup as well. So then he clamped down and Servokula actually, who was who, had, who was being undermined all the time, whenever he tried to put a cordon around the parliamentary complex, he was countermanded by people on, on above him. He couldn't understand it. But eventually, when Beni Marama then threw in his support about actually getting these people, you know, uh, uh, out and, and, and arrested and all that, then the 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 uh, uh, coup failed, and and the Evans Board of Inquiry report has got a, a, a very very strong statement to make, right? And and this is something that the people in the in the RMFF RFMF now should think about very very seriously, including its current commander, you know, Colonel Wai, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the Evans Board of Inquiry report concluded, undoubtedly, I'm just quoting now, uh, Sashi, right? The legislation provides RFMF with the primary function of protecting the constitution, the commander in chief, the president of Fiji, the government of the day. That's what is there in the legislation, right? Right. And there was two words added by AIAS, which was never there, which I'll talk about. And, and the Evans Board of Inquiry report, you know, concluded, this is page 234. And page 11, a uh, page LI, whatever it is, right, in the, in the beginning, the RFMF, in effect, failed its mission when it asked the president to step down and abrogated the constitution or tried to abrogate it, right, which it couldn't, right? Mm. Now, now Sashi, I'll give you an analogy, Sashi, right? Let's say in Australia here, right, a group of soldiers, you know, decide, hey, I'm going to take, we're going to take over the country, right? And uh, they, they take over some, some, building or something like that, like the parliamentary complex, hold the parliamentarians hostage, right? And and the, and 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 then the military says, ah, we're going to impose order. Uh, Prime Minister, you step down. You abrogate mm. the constitution. I'm going to take over. Can you imagine what would happen in Australia if a military guy tried to do that to the Prime Minister of the country? Oh, blooming hell. I tell you what, all the Total farmers revolt. in the country all the farmers in the country will bring, be bringing out their knives, you know, and these military guys, you know, will be told where to put their bloody rifle barrels, right? But mm. in Fiji, that's what happened. I mean, how dare, how dare anybody ask the president, Ratu Marad, the commander-in-chief, to step down so that, you know, the, the, the RFMF with 3,000 soldiers can, can bring these 30 soldiers under control and abrogate the constitution to boot. Mm. That's what they did. How dare they? But this is what Frank Benimarama did in 2000. And the historians, you know, don't want to look at the basic facts and the stupidity of their bloody historical analysis and, and going by the rhetoric of what Benimarama was saying, right, in 2000. So anyway, they did this. And uh, honestly, you know, I mean, I'll come to Gates' judgment later on about what, what whether constitution can be abrogated or not. But, uh, you know, the result of that was when all the CRW soldiers in parliament felt that they had the support of Beni Marama and the high command, for all the reasons I've outlined. And then, you know, suddenly they were being arrested and put into jail. Okay. Well, the 2000 mutiny by some. Uh, yeah, I was just going to come to that. Because that leads me to that question as to why did the 2000 mutiny take place? And what were the implications for the 2006 coup? Well, when the mutiny took place, because, you know, the CRW soldiers felt betrayed. And, and I have been told by, 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 by military people higher up that they felt very sad that the CRW soldiers were left, uh, they were left high and dry. They left, the word that they used was they were left to dry out by the military high command. Even Lingeri felt that very bitterly, although he went away quietly and never, never revealed any of the truth, right? But uh, the CRW soldiers felt betrayed, and some of them actually tried to do uh, a mutiny. It was very badly managed and all that. And then they had the support of civilians and some high chiefs, right? And in that, uh, Beni Marama had to run for his life. And according to the ANU PhD thesis by John A. Balendrokondroka, which I've you know, had, had to read through and sift for the truth, he, he said he, he, he took his commander down to the naval base for his own protection. 
mm-hmm. right? I mean, how, how, how extra, extraordinary to take your commander down to somewhere for his protection. The mutineers failed, most were arrested. And, you know, following the mutiny, there was also five soldiers arrested by Serivakula, who were not part of the mutiny, but he put them into the custody of the Nambua police station for their safety. And they were taken from Nambua police station by some soldiers. And the number of police were reluctant to give them up, but gave them up only because they 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 were told that it was under the orders of not just John A. Balindrogan Drucker, but also Frank Beni Marama. And the five soldiers were uh, Celestino Kalonivalu, Kalonivale, John Davui, Epineri Bainimoli, Langani Rokowanga, and Yuane Waseroma. Right? They were taken away. And, uh, you know, Balen Drokan Drokan in his PhD thesis writes, right, the order to assault members of these five CRW soldiers who were in police custody after the mutiny of November 2nd could have been issued by the military commander Varenge Beni Marama. I'm quoting his thesis. Could have been issued by them, right? Uh, I think uh, those two gentlemen, I think, know more than we know. But those five soldiers, by the night's end, they were dead in the morgue. And they were not necessarily part of the mutiny. And they were, there was no judge, no trial, no jury, and they were mad. I mean, I mean, I just feel, you know, how on earth can our country forget that five people were just tortured to death like that, right? And no inquiry into it. No inquiry into it. Wow. That is indeed very, very sad. Um, well, then you've said that there have been terrible, terrible long-term implications of this tragedy not just for the 2006 coup, but beyond, to the rejection of the Yashgai report. Let's discuss that. Well, your views on that, please. Yeah, well, well, well the reason why uh, uh, that mutiny and, and what happened afterwards is important for the future is that this, this death of uh, five, five soldiers is not just uh, any journalist's interpretation or news item, right? It was actually verified by uh, a magistrate, uh, named Ajmal Gulab Khan, he heard a, a comp- employee's compensation case, right? <laughs> he said, I, you, you, can, you might want to laugh at it. It's so serious and, and horrible, right? An employee's compensation case by the wife of Colony Valu? Mm-hmm. Employee compensation when your husband is murdered in cold blood? Oh, oh, James, you know, this is just horrible. But, you know, Ajmal Gulab Khan confirmed, right? And he said in his judgment, the basic facts are undisputed, right? And I'm quoting from his judgment, right, which has been reported, you know, you know, in, in journals, in law journals and things. He said, on 2nd November 2000, he was at home attending to his sick child while his wife was at work. Excuse me, Wadden. Yeah. Can you just slow down a bit and not slow rush okay. that part? Please. Okay, okay. Yes. okay. So he said okay. uh, the basic facts are undisputed. Yes. Please continue. He said it's undisputed. So on 2nd November, uh, Kalunivalu was at home attending to his sick child while his wife was at work. So he was not in, in the mutiny, right? He was picked up by soldiers in the Tamavu area Tamavu area, and taken to the Central Police Station. After 4 p.m. that day, he was seen being taken out of the Central Police Station along Pratt Street in an army van with sounds of beating and crying. Around midnight, on that night, on 2nd 11, 2000, he was taken to the mortuary. Postmortem was conducted on 8th November 2000. Cause of death was found to be multiple blunt force injuries, including head injuries with subdural hemorrhage. And Kadim Solomone, my friend Kadim Solomone, is a lovely guy, you know, uh, he, he in the in the army who conducted the court martial for the 2000 mutineers. He called for an investigation into the RFMFs disloyalty virus which had the potential this is which had the potential to become an epidemic right with several military officers who were responsible for the upheavals in 2000 and no such investigation has ever been done under Beni Marama for 16 years so that is also described in Balin Drucker Drucker's uh, thesis you know I mean so so the thing is that this is a legal case right and a, and a huge abuse of human rights and I'll come back to that, you know, when we talk about the 2013 uh, constitution mm. of the piece of paper. Wow. Um, <clears throat> it, it just uh, is amazing that people have not been brought to account in the last, uh, what, two, 2002, uh, 20 years or so. It is yes. absolutely amazing. Yep. Now, the 2006 school, you just mentioned that. Yes. Why did Mbani Marama 
carry out that coup. And uh, I also understand he made a number of promises. What did he promise? Well, he promised no military officer would stand for elections, right? What a joke. He said no military officer would benefit from the coup. What a joke. I mean, he and his family have been the biggest beneficiaries. And he, in fact, is probably the greediest prime minister Fiji has ever known, right? And, and you know, it doesn't have to do anything, right? He just supports Kayum, whatever he does. Kayum, you know, all the dirty work is done by Kayum and even his speeches written by him. So, you know, Graham Davis says, you know, on his blog, you know, Benny Marama is just a puppet who has been played by his master ventriloquist, Ayaz Kayum. Right? Well, there's also, in my opinion, other puppet masters behind the scene who have benefited and who are the power behind the throne, which is the military council, whoever they are, mm -hmm. a very shady set of people, right? Anyway, why, why did Benny Marama do the coup? Well, between 2000 and 2006, Garase had tried to not renew his contract and he refused to obey orders from the, the civil service or from Garase that there will be a new commander, right? There were investigations into the misuse of military funds. Millions were given to a well-known store in Wamano Road. I won't, I won't uh, uh, name that store, right? Only half was used for goods. The other half was used for the benefit of a few select RFMF officers, right, kept by them. And then the most important to me, and this is something that, uh, that I, I just find it very hard to believe, who cares what historians and academics like me write and all that, right? Who cares, I mean, right? But the police commissioner, Andrew Hughes, the last honest police commissioner we had, is an Australian guy, right? When he fled for his life to Australia, he told ABC News that one reason for the 2006 coup was that they were investigating Benny Marama's part in the 2000 mutiny. And, and what happened? He, and he said, he says, and I, and I quote, he's been resistant to the investigation into the murder of the CRW soldiers in 2000. This mm -hmm. is Andrew Hughes. And Andrew Hughes was backed in that statement by Police Commissioner uh, Alexander Downer. Not Police uh, Commissioner. Foreign, foreign Minister. Australia, foreign Minister. Uh, Alexander. Uh, this interview is too long. He says, yeah, I'm losing my marbles. Anyway, he was backed by Australian Foreign Minister Alexander Downer, right? And, and, and the reason why I think he was backed is that when Andrew Hughes escaped from Fiji, he took all the files with him. So I suspect that the Australian uh, ASIO has got all these files, right? But, you know, so that was the first set of reasons, you know, why Benny Marama did it's his own self-preservation. He could not allow Garas's government, the Fiji, the, the SDL, Fiji Labour Party uh, coalition government to continue ruling. He had to do the, the coup to stop them, right? And he disobeyed. He disobeyed orders from the prime minister. He committed, you know, sedition and all that. There was an investigation of misuse of funds and all that. I mean, a lot to answer for. So by remaining as 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 commander and by becoming and getting rid of Garas's government, he saved himself from prosecution. Which brings me to the second point that you made, and that was the active collaboration of civilians. Some knowing that they were supporting something wrong, but you said there were many good people who thought they could do good in Fiji, even if they were supporting treason. But they were all betrayed, you said, and uh, most went away quietly, including all the people who took part in the People's Charter exercise. What did you mean by this statement? Please explain. Yeah, well, 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 this is something which, which I grappled with, because many of the people who supported the Beni Marama military government, they were my friends. They were friends for 30 years, 40 years, you know. And uh, I couldn't understand what the hell's going on. Well, I tell you what, on my on my website, uh, I wrote a paper uh, which is based on 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 this incredible psychologist called Zimbardo, Z I M B A R D O, and my 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 article is entitled is titled "Why do good people do evil?" Mm -hmm. Now, Zimbardo was investigating how in Guantanamo Bay, decent U.S. soldiers were torturing the detainees. And they were detailed, de 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 yeah, decent people, you know, how on earth? And so he tried to ex examine why on earth, you know, were they doing, they were doing uh, uh, evil when they were such good people, decent soldiers, law-abiding soldiers, right? And in that, in Zimbardo's writings, he goes through a lot of other things like the prisoner's experiment. And this is a fantastic one. It's all going into psychology, you know, I mean, economy is going mm -hmm. into psychology now, right? But, uh, but in there, there was a prisoner's experiment where decent people, they were told, okay, you're going to play act. You'll be the guard, and these are the prisoners. And gradually, over over a few days, the prisoners became more and more brutalized, 
And the guards, who were decent people, became more and more brutal. And in the end, that experiment was discontinued because the scientists who were doing this experiment couldn't believe what they were seeing in front of them, that decent people could become brutal if you gave them certain roles to play. So in that article, it's all there. But you know, but what about this? Yeah, the Fiji experience. Fiji experience is that all yeah. these people, none of them thought they were doing evil. None of them thought they were doing wrong. They actually all believed that Beni Marama's rhetoric, we're going to el eliminate corruption. And then when people like John Sami and them came to Fiji to build, a, went through the charter exercise, which is, remember, it was remember it was, char it was chaired by the late Archbishop Matada, right? Mm -hmm. All my good friends, including Aquila Yambaki, Robin Nair, and all that, right? My stalwarts from FLP, Arya Samaj, many USP academics, right? They all joined in this charter exercise because they thought Beni Marama was going to remove corruption. He was going to bring about equality in Fiji, you know, between Fijians and Indians and others. He was going to call everybody, you know, Fijians. He was going to have one vote of equal value and all that. And they all believed that this was all good things. And so a coup, a military coup to remove a, a, a properly elected government was okay, as long as you've got these good objectives. And to me, it reminded me of, of what people were saying in 87 and 2000. You remember, Sashi, the cause. The cause justifies the means. Means. Hmm. Well, well, I, you know, I've always felt that uh, the method is just as important as the cause. And, and a coup is a coup is a coup. You can't achieve good by taking a fundamentally false position. And in the process of 2006 coup, I tell you what, the Indo-Fijians have left the moral high ground and they're now right on the bottom with all the other people who've supported coups over the years, and Fiji is ready for a genuine reconciliation. But, you know, the thing is, you know, uh, the charter, to its great advantage, you know, great credit, although they pretended to have this signing exercise all over Fiji that 425,000 people over the age of 18 have signed, it, consulted, and 92% have approved it. The percentage came down to 67% later. But unfortunately, you know, it also said, we, the people of Fiji, we commit to support the constitution. Well, Beni Marama wasn't interested in supporting the constitution, and neither was Kayum. They had they had other other plans. So the charter was conveniently forgotten, and John Sami went away. Right, but uh, you know John Sami is a decent bloke. I tell you, right? You know uh, he is one of those guys who honestly is a radical guy. He's a socialist fellow. He had quite a lot of you know interactions with me and I, and I absolutely like him right he wrote he and he and an archbishop matada the late archbishop matada they protested to beni marama in a letter of 2010 this is are quite early are you are you yeah. privy to that letter oh I yes it's on my it. website yeah no it's on okay. my website yeah, so it's on my, anybody anybody can read it and so i'm quoting for it and this okay. is 2010 right He's one mm -hmm. of uh, Benny Marama's biggest supporters. If you remember, he was going to New York, you know, and, and helping uh, uh, Benny Marama speak at the UN and all that, right? And, and, and he says, in his letter, he and Archbishop Matada, they said, the interim government has betrayed Fiji on the most solemn of its promises. This is John wow. Sami and Archbishop Matada, right? And in the abrogation of the 97 constitution, the imposition of the public emergency regulations for more than two years. There's a growing sense of fear among the population. There are serious issues of transparency, accountability, and overall governments. There's a militarization of the key institutions of the state. This is very serious. This is a very serious criticism made by John Sami. The handling of the pension issues, FNPF. And there's a feeling among those who have supported you. There's a growing feeling of being betrayed by you and that you're only paying lip service to the principles of the charter. Now, people should uh, should, uh, should 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 uh, understand John Sami more. He's one of the first graduates of USP. He was pushed out of, 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 of his, his job as a director of planning office in 1987 because of the coup and the cleanup of Indo-Fijians from the civil service. He felt very bitter, but he was a person of great ability and he went and joined the ADB and he rose in the ADB. He was actually head of the office, ADB office in Vietnam and all that, you know, where I think he learned about the charter exercise. He's a person of great ability and Fiji lost him, you know, because he emigrated after the 87 coup. And, and, you know, okay. here he is. He and Matada were saying all these things, right? It's not my words. Those are his words, right? But 2010, it was all too late. By the time certain people had got hold of the reins of power and they were charging full speed ahead. Okay. Now, let's turn our attention at this stage. Um, I'm sorry you, you initially said to me that you only wanted to speak for about an hour. 
What and, can we uh, do, mate? Yep. We, we have uh, still a few topics to discuss, and uh, I beg your pardon if we can continue. Um, yep. Thank go you. On, go on, go on. Yeah, go right. ahead. Uh, let's uh, yeah, turn ahead. our attention uh, yep. to the Yashgai Constitution. Yep. Well, I'll let you stretch out. Why yeah, no, I've got a bad back. Okay. Bad, bad well, back ch chopping logs for my grandkids to toast their marshmallows on. Oh, good on you. All right. <laughs> Thing, thing, <laughs> things that pops do. Oh, okay. Yeah. While on the subject of the People's Charter, yeah. another very important document that eventually got trashed, in fact, burnt, was the <laughs> Yeshgai Constitution, yeah. in fact, the draft constitution. Yeah, 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 but the yeah. irony of the whole situation was that the Yeshgai Commission was appointed by Mr. Kayum. Now, what mm -hmm. can you share with us on this aspect? Well, thing is, this went on for two years, and I was initially skeptical uh, because uh, Kayum had appointed uh, his old professor from Hong Kong, Yash Gai, as the chairman. There was a, a, a another ex a foreign uh, illegal expert, you know, Christina M M Murray or something. And then there were all these regime supporters, you know, Satinder Nandan, Taufa Bakatale, Penny Moore, right? And so, uh, these are all handpicked, you know. Uh, what will they come up with? But, you know, we said, okay, here's an opportunity. Let's do the best that we can, you know, for it. And and I I, I wrote a very, very long submission to the Yashgai Commission. It's all on my website, right? A massive, long concept. Oh, it's like a minor master's thesis, I tell you. Right? But, but and, in, and in, in just, I, in just a, pardon me, in just a few sentences, perhaps, yeah. can you sum up what your submission was to the Constitution, uh, to the Commission? Oh, it's everything in there. Uh, 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 yeah, Sashi, it's a cool culture, the economy, electoral system, the whole governance, the way forward, the need to bring all the countries to the country together, the, the the need to bring political parties together, and all that massive, massive amount of stuff, stuff. Right? It's all there. I can't. I just don't have the time to go through it. No, no, right? that's fine. But but, 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 what I also, but what I also did was I gave an actual workshop uh, for Yash Guy and his mates at the USP Lecture Theatre. I took them through what my proposal was for a good electoral system, right, which is very similar to the New Zealand electoral system. You have local constituencies, half of the, the seats in parliament, but the overall other half came from proportionality, which would also enable part, political parties to put up a party list where they could alternate between men and women on their list so that when the people from their list were chosen, you'd have gender balance in parliament, right? So I took them through all this thing. You'd have overall proportionality. No vote would be would be would be would be trashed or anything, right? And it was a pretty well accepted, except that what the Yashkai Commission came up with was they had four constituencies instead of the twenty-six. And 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 honestly, the four constituencies they saw would mean that Benny Marama could only stand in one constituency. In the mm -hmm. other three constituencies, you know. His people would have to compete with everybody else, right? And right. and so what? 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 Of course, the the, the mastermind uh, did in the Benny Marama government. Hey, let's have one constituency in the whole country, and not only that, we won't allow names, we won't allow party symbols, we won't allow anything that identifies who that person is except a number, one number. And of course, the whole campaign to the whole country vote for this one number, and that's what they did. So that one fellow got something like, you know, I don't know, 90% of the Fiji First Party votes. Mm. Three cunning people, very smart people, including Kayum, uh, Pravin Bala, and uh, and uh, Mandra Reddy, and Inoke Kumbumbala, four people. They got decent number of votes. The rest got less than six, seven hundred. So that what happened in parliament is that basically the two, three, four people they basically are the only people who had popular mandate. The others had so little votes behind them, they had to do what they are told for the last eight years. Whatever the, you know, the two bosses say, do this, do this, do it. And if they don't do it, like Dr. Neil Sharma or like uh, Mary Requita, you know, uh, they send packing. So, so okay. I mean, you know, yeah, so, so it, that, that young guy draft constitution actually had, had, a, had an electoral system which uh, these people didn't want, but there were other things in there which these people didn't want at all which which brings me to the question why was the draft constitution rejected well i tell but, you what yeah, yeah i tell you what uh, this uh, horrifying thing is that ipeli nelitikau right when he as 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 president right, rejected it as well right he said it is an anathema to democratic representation that the guide draft allows for 144 member 
body of unelected people, the People's Assembly, deciding on key issues to the people of Fiji. Can you imagine Ratu Ipil and Elitika, you know, objecting to 144, you know, assembly, People's Assembly, right? Advising on 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 on, on everything, right? And mm-hmm. what did he do? He, one person, signed it. No parliament has ever approved it. Beni Marama must have approved it. And Kayum resigned it in his offices. So three persons actually are behind the 2013 so-called constitution. Right? How how ridiculous, right? So he, he rejected it. But you know, when I when I looked at uh, at, uh, at at what was in the Yash Gai draft constitution, right? And I asked myself, well, what is there that uh, that Beni Marama and Kayum uh, and the powers behind them, right? Had the shadowy figures behind them, one big fella, right? Why would they have objected to this guy draft? Guy draft, right? Okay, I'll, I'll list what they are, right? One, it did not grant immunity for abuse of human rights. Remember the murder mm-hmm. of the five CRW soldiers, right? Right. Two, it granted immunity only those who took an oath renouncing their support of illegal regimes. You have to renounce. You have to take an oath. Renouncing your support of illegal regimes. Wow. Can you imagine that happening, right? Mm. Three, the regime would have to give way to a caretaker government six months before the 2014 elections. And they wouldn't <laughs> want that. What would they want to do that? They're going out giving freebies everywhere, <laughs> you know, right up to the election, right? Uh, they would be an end to the tenure of the present, current president, Nelitikau. He would have to be, he would have to be gone. And oh, therein yeah. lies the problem as well. One as well, and all this is and this is the this is the interesting one. Fifth, right? And this has mm. got bearing now on what's going on in Fiji now, right? All members of the security forces. It's all this is all part of the Yash Guide draft, right? Army, police, and prisons are explicitly required to not obey unlawful orders from their superiors the moment the draft constitution came into effect. Wow. They are explicitly required to not obey unlawful orders. Now, you know, uh, Sashi, all good, you know, uh, militaries and, and naval forces everywhere in the world, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, etc., there are there are things there in the constitution which protects military officers. You must not obey unlawful orders. You know, currently there's a case in court in Australia, you know, about P- yes. about some officers who, who shot yeah. uh, dead some Afghanis, right? Yes. And and some 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 people are saying, oh, he ordered us to shoot them, right? Well, yes. you know, in in Australian law, you can't say, oh, I was ordered to shoot somebody. That's not a defense. So in in the regime, the, the, there is this there is this clause which says that all members of security forces, army, police, and prisons, are required to not obey unlawful orders. And six, you know, most important again, halfway through the commission's work, this happened while they were still discussing and all that, right? The regime promulgated yet another decree because they could see what was coming in the Yash draft, right? So they were desperate. They were desperate now. And they they they, they promulgated another decree signed by Ratu Ipeli in Elitikau that stopped the commission's exercise in listing which of the regime decrees, which of the regime decrees must be modified in order to be consistent with the new constitution. And as part of that, any legal cases terminated by military decree must be revived. That was part of the constitution. So that legal cases, the, yes, guy, legal no. cases could have been revived. Could have been. No, no, not could have been. Must be revived. Oh, must be. Must be. Must revived. be revived. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that revived. that yeah. that would immediately place people in a very very dangerous situation. Yep. Um, yep. What else was revealed? Well, what was the thing is what happened actually is that Nele Tikau then basically passed the passed this whole uh, draft to the AG constitution. I mean, you've said it was burnt publicly, right? <laughs> Why yes. would you burn a piece of paper, right? But, you know, it was put together by a long, extensive cult- consultation right around the country. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, the Yash Gai draft constitution has much in it to recommend it. I still would not agree with the electoral system, right? Of of four constituencies, I'd have the normal, you know, of twenty five constituencies or whatever. But there's a lot in it that's of value, and I think that eventually, when Fiji comes to its senses, 
right? What we'll have to do is to start from the only lawful constitution, which is the 97 constitution, and see how it can be changed using what Yash Guy draft uh, said and all that. Maybe there may be something in the 2013 constitution which could be useful, I don't know. But, you know, have something that actually which the, which the elected parliament, a fairly elected parliament of Fiji can approve by consensus, you know. So, so but anyway, that thing went to the Yash Guy, uh, uh, sorry, that went to Ayaz Kayum's offices. And people in the Ayaz's offices, including some people, I mean, who have themselves were given the boot uh, recently right, by, by Ayaz, right? Uh, they, 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 they just said, this is now the constitution of Fiji. And to change any element, and this is the incredible part about it, hey, three persons allegedly brought it into law, right? He barely signed it. What powers did he have? Who knows? Bai would have approved it. He's the prime minister. It was created in Ayaz's office. So there are three people signed it, right? But to change it in that 2013 constitution, you require 75% of parliament. Mm -hmm. And then... You re require a referendum and 75% of all voters in Fiji. Wow. Three people to approve it, 300,000, 400,000 to bring about a single change in that piece of paper. Yeah, well, then um, I, I read one of your articles. Yeah. And uh, as we know, most people know that the 2013 constitution, as you've just described it, was imposed on Fiji. As you say, three people uh, yeah. imposed their rights. You termed it a pathetic process. Uh, um, my, my question is, why? I know you've just dealt with the changes, require 75% of uh, people in a referendum, etc. cetera. Um, that itself is ridiculous. But what other reasons did you have to call it pathetic? Well, first of all, th there is the legal judgments on these things, uh, uh, Sashi. Not, not, not my, not, not my personal opinion, you know, which is uh, based on what I've said just now, right? But you know, in in two thousand, when uh, when when Beni Rama claimed that he had abrogated the constitution, and even even Garase actually tried to support that at that point in time, right? This is one of the sad things, you know, about some of our politicians who I like, but they have done some bad things as well. They tried to say, okay, the constitution has been abrogated. There was a Chandrika Prasad case, you remember? I remember. Yeah. Okay. The judgment was made in that, and Gates was part of that judgment, and and basically he said that no, it, it hasn't been it hasn't been abrogated. Went to an appeal court, and the appeal court supported uh, uh, Gates' judgment that no, it hasn't been abrogated, right? And then of course in Fiji there was a final. Although Gates and Patsik and Burns after the 2006 coup, they turned turned around and said no, 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 it, it has been abrogated. But the appeals court judgment in 2009. The last legal opinion on these alleged abrogations, it said, mm. no, it has not been abrogated. And to me, though, and, and, and the, the ironic thing is this, right? To me, the clearest uh, statement of all these is not all these legal judgments, right? But in, in 2001, right? And, and, and this is a very funny little thing in a way, right? In a, in, in a, in a FERCA case, a tax mm -hmm. case, it was a Koroi versus Commissioner of Inland Revenue. Right, Corey versus Commissioner Vinley. This is there in the legal books, right? Uh, Tony Gates made 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 a couple of made three three statements which are quite profound. And even though when he was illegally made Jeff, uh, Chief Justice, right, by Nazar Shamim, right, even though he changed his tune afterwards, right, but what he said in two thousand and one is absolutely the correct situation at the moment. And let me read in what he said, right, and it's there actually everywhere in the in in the Peck Lee. Uh, uh, USP database on laws of Fiji and all that, right? So the case was Koroi versus uh, Commissioner, Koroi of, versus Inland Commissioner of Inland Revenue, right? Okay. And it's there in Peckley records, you know, all legal judgments and so on. So what did what does Anthony Gates say? He said, it is not possible for any man to tear up the constitution. He has no authority to do so. The constitution remains in place until amended by parliament, a body of elected members who collectively represent all of the voters and inhabitants of Fiji. Wow. 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 So, right? not and then possible. he went on to say, yeah. no, 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 just reiterating, yeah. Yeah. Anthony Gates in this judgment says it is yeah. not possible for no. any man to tear up the constitution. No. 
He has no authority. no authority to do so. And, and it remains in place until right. amended by parliament. Okay, next point. Right? A, a body of elected members who collectively represent all of the voters and inhabit. Gates went further. He was actually talking about uh, other people, right? <laughs> Garasa and everybody else, right? He said, right. usurpers may take over as they have in other jurisdictions and in some cases rule for many years. Mm -hmm. Apparently outside of or without the constitution. But eventually the original order has to be revisited and the constitution resurfaces. Okay. And what, uh, what he said further was, for the courts cannot pronounce lawfulness based simply on the will of the majority. Hmm. This is extraordinary, Sashi. Yes. It cannot pronounce lawfulness based simply on the will of the majority, right? And the courts will not assist usurpers simply because they are numerous, powerful, or even popular. In other words, in other words, I mean, you know, you you you, you can't just impose a, a constitution of people and say, hey, I've run I've run the country for ten years. The people are obviously with me because nobody has risen in protest and all the rest of it. Gates actually was very clear, you know, what he said. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it it is absolutely, you know, staggering. Um, yeah. What what damage was and what damage has it really done to Fiji? I mean. Maybe some Fiji First Party supporters would ask, and I hate to say this, but maybe they would ask, is it not just a piece of paper? Yeah. Well, the trouble is, you know, whenever Ayaz and, and Beni Marama have done some things, they've tried to refer to this 2013 document, which they call a constitution, right? But, but you know, you look at what is it managed to do in Fiji, right? What is it? Well, one, you've got an elected parliament under their rigged system, when the supervisor of elections actually is their appointee who was forced onto the country uh, against the wishes of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission didn't want him, but they forced him on, right? So he's their man, right? And this 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 government basically it's not even become a farce where they don't even have voting. No votes are counted. This by allegedly by acclamation and all that, right? But what have they done? One, they have removed the upper house, which used to be a checks and balances mechanism on the lower house. Every good parliament in the world, you know, like Australia, you've got a house of, you know, the lower house of representatives, and then you've got the Senate. Fiji had that. How you constitute the Senate, of course, is another big question, right? But there was a checks and balances. In Fiji today, there's no checks and balances. Once this Beni Marama Kayum government decide this is going to be it, that's what it is, right? So they, they, they've removed the upper house, which is a very important mechanism. They've imposed a bastardized electoral system. There is no independence of judiciary, no independence of civil service, no independence of military, police or prisons, electoral office, human rights and develop and, 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 and anti-discrimination commission or FICEC. There's a total control of the media. So this is what these pieces of paper have been used to justify. Now, of course, it's not the paper doing it, right? It's the people behind the paper, the people with the power, the people who hold the guns, Beni Marama with his military council. And Kayum, you know, doing all the apparent, you know, hard work and all that, right? But you know, it's it's the people behind whose 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 intentions, you know, need to be need to be corrected, you know. And and the thing is that what this piece of paper does, right? And and I and I will and I will quote from you, right? Section one three one. Yes, I was going to come to that. That's yeah. the yeah. that, that was that's going to be key. my that's the key that, thing. That's the key. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, section the... 131, right, mm. says in here, which is more than what the Evans Board of Inquiry report said, you know, was the duty of the military. It's gone beyond. And what is done is that in addition to the security and defense of Fiji and all Fijians, they've added three words there, and well-being. And well-being. Well -being. And now they're saying it shall be the overall responsibility of the Republic of Fiji military forces to ensure at all times the security, defense, and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians. What the hell? What the hell? Well-being of Fiji is the job of the elected parliament, government, and opposition, right? It's not responsible. The military is not responsible. I mean, you know, a bunch of undereducated guys marching around with uniforms and guns and doing a coup every now and then. What 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 ability do they have? What talents do they have? For ensuring the well-being of Fiji, what a joke! Mm -hmm. But already, you know, co commander, 
uh, colony colony Y has referred to this this this, this section 131. Beni Marama talks about it. Kayum talks about it. And my feeling is that this piece of paper, if the election results don't go the way of these fellows who are currently running the show, they're going to say Section 131 of our constitution, not yeah. approved by any parliament, not approved by people of Fiji, or approved by three persons, right? It says that we can interfere in what goes on in Fiji. For the well-being Gileho. of Fiji. Yeah, and Gileho can do that too. And you, you mm. notice, of course, in the last couple of years, Gilio, Kupili's commissioner, has been actually taking in members of parliament for questioning. Now, what the hell is his role for taking in members of parliament for questioning? He's a thug in the 2000 coup. You know, he's mm. the one who, who, who roughed up my brother-in-law, Brijalal, you know, and sent him packing mm. out of Fiji. What does Gilio know about how to run Fiji for the well-being of people in Fiji? Here, yeah, to me, he's an utter disgrace. And I noticed, actually, there was a good police commissioner there, Tundravu, I was a, who was a career policeman, and you know he's gone. Now, you can actually, you know, join up the dotted dot points there, yeah? yeah, and and you know remember what the what the the uh, what the what the Evans Board of Inquiry report concluded. You know that the army had failed to protect the government of the day. It failed. So if the new government of the day comes in, elected by whether it's whether it's Rambuka or, or Narube or Biman Prasad or anybody, right? And and if somebody decides to do a coup to remove this elected government, yeah, this this uh, this clause one three one can be used by the military to justify it. That clause should not be there. And any time any time that uh, that military commander says, you know, I shall abide by this clause, well, I think the people of Fiji, if they accept it, they deserve what they get. You know, and, me... and I'm worried about one more thing, though, Sir Sashi. Right? Yes. If the military in Fiji do another coup. They are going to jeopardize a very positive development that's taking place in the Pacific in terms of greater cooperation between Australia and New Zealand and Fiji and the other Pacific Islands. Because they want to have closer relations. They are frightened, of course, of China and all the kind of rubbish over there, right? But mm -hmm. they, they, want, they want to have closer relations, including, of course, closer relations with the military. So they have invested very heavily, for example, in that Black Rock facilities in Western Fiji. Sashi. Yes. And they want to do more. But if you have another coup, well, the Australian military people will be scratching their head. Oh, Jesus, do you do we do we want to work together with these guys, you know, who, who do the a coup at the drop of a hat, you know? No, no, I mean, I think there's a heavy responsibility of Commander Colony Vai and on, on Police Commissioner, you know, Giliho, right, to not go down this line, line anymore or to utter any more uh, public uh, uh, sentences, not to interrogate any more parliamentarians or, or newspaper journalists or publishers or whatever, right? Their job is to stay in the background and do the job that they're supposed to do traditionally. Let me ask you this question. You mentioned today, and uh, history tells us, that the military failed terribly yes. when... Uh, the military did not even look after its own commander-in-chief in Ratu Sirka Mara and removed him. With this section 131, where the military is supposedly to look after the well-being of Fiji and all Fijians, what would your advice be to Major General Chone Koloniwai? I, I would actually advise him very strongly, first of all, to remember that this 2013 so-called constitution is only a piece of paper that that was never in the constitution before this, right? And their duties in Fiji are very, very limited in to, 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 to protecting Fiji against external neighbors. And the Fiji police to, to maintaining peace and security within Fiji. And they are not there to interpret this phrase, well-being of Fiji and Fijians, in any other way. They cannot, they cannot use that to remove a democratically elected government they cannot use that to go and, and, and intimidate politicians who are saying things which they don't like. If politicians say something which can be challenged in court, by all means, but not using this piece of paper. Okay. Let me now move our discussion to the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party post-election coalition. The previous alliance between Sitiveni Rambuka's SVT and the NFP under Mr. J. Ram Reddy failed. What would be different this time? 
Well, I think that uh, quite a few quite a few things, right? I mean, different electoral system for a start. So you know, a, a solid party is not going to be eliminated from parliament like NFP. If if a Nauru-based party gets five percent, yeah, with no guarantee of that, of course, and 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 SDL, right? There's no guarantee. So Delpa, there's no guarantee that they, they they can't be removed from parliament as long as they get five percent, right? So that's different, right? Uh, this the the Rambuka, of course, you know, people are 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 looking at him. Well, he did the coup in eighty seven. Maybe he had he had something going on behind the scenes in two thousand. But to me, one of the things that strikes me, as it was in ninety nine, is that he's always been willing to work with other people in Fiji, other leaders in Fiji, right? And you know, uh, he, you know, he's not a one man show mm -hmm. or a two man show. And I believe he's going to get some very, very good candidates uh, standing for him, just as Biman will and Sa Save Narube will and so on, right? So whatever government that comes in, you know, are going to have a very, very uh, cooperative, collaborative team of people who, you know, who will work, you know, sensibly in all the different ministries to try and, and grow the economy and make people's lives better. It will not be a two-man show as, as it has been, you know, under, under Beni Marama and, and Kayum. Right, and and I just see yesterday they put a very good MOU. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to come to that. Come yeah, I'm going to yeah. come to that. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, since since you've raised the MOU, yeah. Um, what's what's your feelings about the MOU? Well, to me, it has got the essential elements, you know, that uh, that uh, uh, our multi-party government has, except that our multi-party government was was legislated. You have to form a multi-party government. This one is just an agreement. Mm. And of course, the, 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 the implementation of it depends on the goodwill of, of, of uh, uh, People's Alliance Party and uh, uh, an NFP. I have no doubt about NFP's intentions because I know the people in there and I know they've always been. NFP is the oldest party in Fiji. To be honest, you know, they've never supported any coup or anything, although there were people behind the scenes, you know, in the NFP who were very happy to run with coups, right? Uh, but, but you know, they have never done that. And Biman Prasad, I mean, you know, honestly, well, I, I've actually said to him, you know, you, you're, you're sometimes, you know, you're as stupid as I was in 96 in, in sacrificing a good academic job where you could be earning, you know, $100,000, $200,000, right? In, in, you know, no no sweat into into a parliament with all these headaches. But he's committed, you know, he's a committed bugger, you know, and he, and he, and he wants to do things. In, and politics is in his veins and arteries, you know. And, uh, and and so I just think that that MOU will be put into effect. He's got some fantastic candidates coming up, people like Richard Naidu and them, right? And Agni Deo Singh is a unionist and everything. You know, and I think the unionists will throw their weight behind these two characters, right? So to me, they are strong. And the MOU allows for a provision that mm -hmm. other parties can join them. And All I right, hope let they me, do. Let, yeah. let me say something. I mean, yeah. uh, I've... And by the way, the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU... Mm -hmm. Uh, viewers, this was published in yesterday's Fiji Times. Now, a couple of things that really, really stands out, uh, Wadhan. Yeah. I've read the MOU, yeah. and I believe that it uh, encompasses a lot of good things. For example, here is a document uh, that and that acknowledges for the indigenous people that, and I quote, "Our Vanua is us, and we are the Vanua." Yeah. yeah. Secondly. Yes. The MOU also acknowledges yes. the descendants of Girmitias yes. and above yes. all, shares yes. the vision for Fiji as a country. Yes. Now, this is, this is wonderfully worded. And yeah. if, it well, can come, <laughs> if it can come into fruition, yeah. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big hope for Fiji. Would you yeah, agree? Well, let me, yeah, let me tell you something. And maybe, maybe you know, I don't know, maybe uh, something that if we can give, give a bit of credit to Beni Marama, you know, mm -hmm. Sashi, right? You know, his constant uh, uh, preaching around Fiji and internationally about all people in Fiji being Fijians and all that. I mean, my personal view is, you know, don't call people Fijians without the, you know, permission of the Fijian people and all that. I call everybody Fiji citizens, right? But Beni Marama has brought about a, a culture and a discussion about the equality of all people. And, you know, you, you remember that uh, a few years ago, Rotumumu Kepa, yes. right? Uh, he he did that whole reconciliation thing at the wreck of the Syria, where yes. she acknowledged yeah, yes. the, the, yes. that, that, you know, the Girmitias and the descendants were part of Fiji and all that. So, yes. so you know, to me, there, there is, there's been a strong movement in Fiji, 
and I see this in many comments on social media and all that, we indigenous Fijians, right, are prepared to accept, you know, people of all other races, including Kailomas and Chinese and Europeans and all that, as equal citizens in Fiji, right? And, and to me, this government has wasted a lot of talent in Fiji of all races because they have kept on bringing in all these puppets from overseas, the Sri Lankan judges and things, people to chair the Public Service Commission from Canada and all that. When we've got fantastic good people here in Fiji to do all this work. And I believe that the fantastic good people of Fiji are going to put their hands up and volunteer, you know, to, to, to serve a good government, you know, which works collaboratively and cooperatively. And what that MOU does, it puts in paper and says yes. And and I actually, to be honest, I mean, I, I agree with that order of that, order of the mm. priorities. I believe actually the indigenous Fijian people, it's the only country in the world, you know, where, where they can have a country of their own, a government in, in which looks after their Indo I mean, Indo-Fijians, well, there's a huge international diaspora. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, the population in Fiji is going the way where they, it's all going to reduce. People in Fiji have no idea. I do because I do detailed, you know, projections of our population. If you went to class one throughout all schools in Fiji in aggregate, Indo-Fijian children at class one are only about 15 percent of total enrollment in Fiji. 15 wow. percent. And right. Indian schools, formerly Indian schools like Indian College, MGM. <laughs> pretty well all mostly Fijian schools now. And it's happening right through. And that proportion is going to move right through the whole population. So to me, having that first clause, giving primacy to the to the indigenous Fijian, Vanua and all that, to me is right. And having as number two, that the descendants of the Girmitia, hey, hey, what about us Dobies, man? Gujarati Dobies, don't forget us Gujarati Dobies, you know, who went <laughs> freely to Fiji and worked just as hard as the Girmitia did. All Indo-Fijians in Fiji will not be neglected and their rights protected under this MOU. So to me, oh, I mean, it's a very strong beginning, you know, very, very strong beginning. And, and I, I, I take my hat off, you know, to Rambuka and, and, uh, and, Benim, and, and Biman and all mm -hmm. the people who are advising them. I mean, hey, hey I tell you something, though. Uh, NFP, I, I suspect that the majority of votes received by NFP have been indigenous Fijian votes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, coming towards the end, uh, yep. perhaps if if uh, I've got maybe half a dozen odd questions, Ooh. I'm going to shift now to yeah. to the USP first. Yeah. Um, maybe if I could combine some questions. Yeah, first okay. one, um, with regards to the USP, yeah. what was the level of academic and intellectual freedoms at the USP under the former Vice Chancellor Rajesh Chandra? Oh, man, I tell you what. At the beginning, it was fine. I mean, you just have to go and look at the record of USP in the period 2006 and 2010. After he became, and he felt, you know, that his we owed his position to to the to the Benimarama government. He just clamped down, imposed censorship. I mean, basically everybody in USP they became frightened. You do, you look at them; they don't hold all those, you know, very vigorous, you know, panel discussions that they used to have. Under under you know what under us you know when we were at USP it was a vigorous dynamic place and whatever academics you know overseas used to say about oh USP is this and that well you're a young university we were really serving our people right and so under under Rajesh Chandra uh, the, the censorship came in so under VC Pal Alwalia I suppose it's, it's slowly opening up but it's going to take a while before our academics at USP feel safe and secure to have vigorous you know academic debate. All right. Now, one story that has been featuring in the U in the news, in terms of the USP, is the non-payment of the sixty odd million dollars USP grant, affecting USP both in the short term and the long term. And if mm -hmm. I may add, uh, who is the biggest casualty of this action? Well, you know, if people want to read about it, you know, when I was the director of planning and development, I wrote a little study for for USP called "Issues in the Financing of of USP." Right. And, and it's, a, it's a funny formula which tries to balance student numbers and benefits and everything else. So basically all governments, they pay a share of the USP bill, which is in proportion of the benefits they receive directly through educating students, indirectly through expenditure in their countries, right? So that document mm -hmm. explains it all. So, so to be honest, it's not a government grant. It's not a free government grant by Fiji government. All mm -hmm. governments have to pay it by this formula. So for Fiji government to stop paying it, Oh, 
Man, they are undermining themselves so badly, you know, in the in the region. It's like you go into a shop, you pick up some loaves of bread. Everybody else has to pay for that bread, right? But you are not going to pay. So the burden, of mm. course, will fall on everybody else, right? It's totally unfair. And and look, the future of USP is more and more in educating indigenous Fijians through university. Indo-Fijians will always have be, be a very strong proportion of students at USP because Indo-Fijians families, they really value education. They will, you know, they will do anything that's needed to get their kids educated and hopefully, you know, emigrate so that they can, their families can have a good life. But the future of USP is always going to be towards training local people, right? And, and mostly, increasingly, it will be indigenous Fijians who are going to be denied. You can't take away $60 million from a university and expect that there's going to be no bad effects. Because sure. other countries can't put up that $60 million. You know, the other countries are so small. Their budgets are so, so, so small. We are the richest country among the USP member countries. How dare we? How dare we? Well, I'll tell you what, man. You know, for the sake of the Fiji's uh, status in the Pacific, I sincerely hope that the next government that comes in immediately returns that missing $60 million, brings back, you know, Alupalia, you know, Aluwalia from Samoa, put him into to Fiji, where 80% of all the USP programs are. You know, how dare Beni Marama and Kayum get their soldiers to pick up this decent law-abiding man in the middle of the night and his, and his wife and send them on a plane off to, to Australia? How dare he do that? I mean, how? Oh. Utterly obnoxious, you know, and I am surprised that Beni Marama and Kayum have got the nerve to go trading, you know, to, you know r- running around the world and 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 talk about this or that and all that. I mean, Naz oh, Shamim, right. Na- Nazat mm-hmm. Shamim, one of the things she should do from her new position is to investigate everything she could prosecute in Fiji. <laughs> all right. Well, then, uh, in closing, a mm-hmm. couple of questions, sir. Uh, what is your message to the people of Fiji today? Well, I think they, I just feel that they have all compromised themselves. The Methodists, you know, the GCC, everybody supported the coups of 2087. You know, uh, except for a few very, very, you know, decent Fijians who opposed it. In 2006, all the decent uh, people, you know, supported the, the, the 2006 coup. You know, and, and, and what I hope actually is that the good people who supported the 2006 coup, having realized their mistake, they do what John Sami did, which is go on record and say, you know, we, we, we condemn what has taken place and we would support something better, right? So I think that one, day, one thing they can all do is to say, enough is enough, no more coups. Enough well is said. enough, no more coups. And, and support the next legal, lawfully elected government. And basically and, and, tell the military, tell the military and police, hey, you are our sons and daughters. Please don't undermine Fiji because all you're doing is you're hurting our lives and livelihoods and those of the future generations. That's what they can do. Well said. Now, you, you mentioned the next government, whichever government it is. At this juncture, is there any message that you'd like to give to all the political parties, including the Fiji First Party? Yeah, I, I think there's there's one message I can give to all of them, including Fiji First Party. I think you know the thing is that in 2014, you know, I I thought why do they want to take part in this election under this rigged you know electoral system? But they did. Then they took part in it again in 2018, and now they're going to take part in it again in 2022, right? So so you know what happened? Of course, was one thing. Uh, political parties like Fiji First Party, they, 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 they worked it out their strategy. We're going to have all the votes going to one person, right? And we don't care if all the other people who come into parliament under our votes, right, have only a few hundred votes. So you could actually get a balambala being elected to parliament as long mm-hmm. as, you know, they're in the, in the right party, right? And it makes for very bad governance because then there's nobody in Fiji First Party who can actually challenge the two big powerful ones at the top? And you know, I can look at it. I mean, Mahendra Reddy is an economist from PH from USP and all that. He could have been doing a lot more than what he has been doing, but he's too afraid. And there are certain people who won't let him actually, you know, you know, you know, stretch his wings and do things. And there are other people in the Fiji First Party who are like that. I would recommend to Fiji First Party people in the election campaign. Go out there and campaign and get the votes for yourself. I would actually recommend to all political parties, you set up your own constituencies. It doesn't matter if Ayaz and Bainimarama say there's one constituency. No, you go to all the different parts of the country, 
set up your constitu constituencies and get the candidates who the local people want so that when they go into parliament, they have three, four, five thousand votes behind them, not 200, not 100. And I think that would make for a, a stronger, stronger, stronger party. And, you know, if, if a Fiji First Party wants to look at one good concrete reason, when they booted out Mary Raquita, right, she went and got an international job at a fantastic salary, right? A person of ability. What the hell was the Fiji First Party cabinet doing? If there is a cabinet there, I, I don't think there's a cabinet there. What were they doing in getting rid of somebody of, of such good ability? What were they doing when they got rid of Nengama, you know, uh, the Kimweli Nengama, the, the government statistician, right? A person of ability, a technical person you can't find. He can get a job in SPC for $200,000 a year. At, at, at Fiji Bureau of States, you'd have been earning about $70,000, $80,000 a year. So, so you need to have a strong parliament where individual parliamentarians are strong enough with their votes up behind them to say to political leaders, even their own leaders, uh, I don't agree with you on that. And not be told, okay. shut up, you only have got 200 votes behind you. All right. A very, very important question next, uh, which I have read on the comment section. Do you still play the guitar and play the mouth organ? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I, right. I, play, I, I play it mostly to my grandchildren you now. So I, I, know, right. I, I know all the children's songs. But yeah, of course, in Fiji, I used to play with the Below Level Club. I used to go and play with my friend Adish Naidu and them, you know, and... Uh, and his friends, uh, I used to play all kinds of songs, Fijian songs, English songs, Hindi songs. I, I still still play. But, you know, I tell you what, most most, uh, most of all, actually, if you ask me for what message would I give, I'd give a message to all the good people in Australia, New Zealand, and mm. Canada, United States, please. You know, I'm sure they all feel betrayed because many of them raised a lot of money for the Fiji mm. First Party, right? They, they, they raised a lot of money and they felt betrayed. I would say to them, look, to err is human. All the people who, who, who think they made mistakes, just, just acknowledge those mistakes publicly the way John Sami and, and Robin Nair and Pio Tikundua have done. You know, They've come up publicly and said, yeah, we were, we were mistakenly supporting that because we thought what they were after was something different. You know, So you know, I think people have to atone for it all and, and, and for the good of Fiji. Because, you know, honestly, it's not we here in, in, in Australia, right? You know, we, we, we don't have to suffer the consequences of what bad politicians and bad governments and bad political parties do, whereas people in Fiji do. And the relatives in overseas, right, they're much better off giving their money to their own families. Don't give money to, to political parties, actually, who are not going to be for the good of Fiji. And well, tell you what, let me let me just say something else uh, in in conclusion, right? And I hope I can disappear, Sashi. Uh, well, yeah. uh, <laughs> your program, your mm. program, right? Uh, I commend your program, you know, for for bringing to the Fiji public and to the international public, you know, our views of 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 decent, honest people who are who are prepared to subject themselves to scrutiny, right? And discuss what is good for for Fiji, what is going wrong with Fiji, and so on, right? And 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 honestly, no media in Fiji is able to do that. Not any of the television media. I mean, Fiji TV has been totally taken over by the Fiji First Government and FBC, of course, with Riaz and 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 all those journalists over there who were once my friends. You know, there are a lot of them are my good friends. They've just become propaganda arms for for the Benimarama government. And newspapers, unfortunately, they're great. Fiji Times is fantastic. Fiji Sun is a propaganda arm. But, you know, not everybody uh, uh, reads. Whereas your program, video, audio, anybody without a degree, without a, a, a day of education can listen to your programs. And so, you know, you've had some great speakers on your program. I see, you know, and, I've, and, I've, and I have actually... Uh, listen to them all, you know, Sashi Kiran, Shamima Ali, Richard Naidu, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Bhiman Prasad, all of them, right? So uh, may I commend uh, your your program, mate? Uh, you are doing Fiji a great service, and uh, you're doing it off your own resources. Nobody is paying you. Well done, mate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wadan. <laughs> I sincerely I appreciate I to, those. <laughs> I think Sorry? I need to go to bed now. <laughs> no, no, sincerely appreciate those words. Look, uh, We've come to the end of the program. Um, really, Professor Wadhan Narsi, a big Vinaka Vakalevu, thank you very, very much. 
for being chief guest in uh, today's episode 17 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you as our chief guest today. I'm sure that the viewers will agree with me when I say that when I say that today you've made a number of revelations known that perhaps was not known to the people of Fiji. Uh, your analysis of the military officers' treasonous coup culture, for instance, since 1987 is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, Wathan, I thank you for your candid response to my questions. I take this opportunity in wishing you all the very best in your writings. Just a reminder to my uh, viewers, you can read Professor Narsi's writings on his blog page, Narsi on Fiji. Once again, Wathan, thank you very much. God bless you. Have a wonderful NSEC long weekend. Thank you, Sashi. Yeah. Take care now. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers now. That was a very that was a very long one hour, I promised you. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate your time. And okay, uh, and 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 uh, how well you spoke about a number of very sensitive issues. Thank you once again. Cheers. Okay, mate, well, cheers, folks, uh, that's uh, our program for today, but it's uh, time for me to reveal next week's chief guest very, very shortly. Well, like I said, uh, a big thank you to our uh, contributor, Nikhil Singh, for his input in the program today, as always. And to my SSPT, SSTP team, a big thank you as well. And to you, our viewers, I sincerely thank you for watching this program. It's sort of getting longer and longer. We initially started with uh, just less than two hours, but I can't really help it when we speak of so many different issues. Now, next Sunday, that's the 1st of May, 2022, our uh, chief guest, yes, indeed, our chief guest will be Ms. Lenora Ngeregere Tambua, National Federation Party Member of Parliament. So don't forget, we'll meet next Sunday at 11 a.m. Sydney time, 1 p.m. in Fiji and New Zealand, and at 6 p.m., on Saturday afternoon in Los Angeles and San Francisco, when our chief guest will be Lenora Ngeregere Tambua. And if you have any questions for Lenora, you can privately message me on the SSTP page. Please like and follow the SSTP page so that you can get instant notifications of all our posts. I wish you all a very safe and a happy week. In closing, I'll leave you with this quote. They who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety, deserve neither liberty nor safety. That's from Benjamin Franklin, and I'll say that again. They who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety, deserve neither liberty nor safety. That's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode 17 with our chief guest, Professor Wadden Narsi. Thank you once again. I am Sashi Singh. Bidding you all goodbye, namaste, and ni samore. Goodbye, world. <laughs>